Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me well. So welcome to this webinar on pan-European digital assets supporting research communities, benefits and opportunities. Apologies for the slight delay in uh, starting, but we had the last minute issue that I'm going to <laughs> tell you <laughs> in a while. Uh, it's, it's really good to see that uh, many participants are with us uh, today. So I just moved to the next uh, slide. Uh, with a couple of housekeeping. So this event is recorded in its entirety and we will share all the material presented by the speakers and also the recordings right after the event. Uh, I please ask you to do not activate your microphone and uh, you have the possibility to ask questions lively. So just raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Otherwise, we please invite you to use the Slido uh, tool to ask your questions. So that will help us in keeping all the questions aligned and to organize the session. You have the event code on the slide and the passcode. So please open this uh, parallel channel and there you can post questions also during the presentations of the speakers. Uh, why this webinar? So why did we organize this? So we wanted to organize this webinar really to showcase how uh, different communities are leveraging on some of the EOSC related project results, in particular, the results of the EOSC Future project and also the Infra EOSC 07 project. And we thought to organize this in a way to match the results and the use cases into the UNESCO Sustainable Development Goals. And in particular, we picked up specific areas. Uh, I'm going to tell you a couple of words about uh, EOSC Future and the Infra EOSCO 7 for those that are not super familiar with these um, EC funded projects. So when it comes to EOSC Future, so the main purpose of EOSC Future is really to build uh, what we call the EOSC Core and EOSC Exchange. What, what are these things? So these are the components that are part of the vision of the European Open Science Cloud to support and enable uh, researchers with their research, keeping them with what we call these digital assets. Also, uh, these tools that EOSC Future is uh, producing are not just uh, standalone things, uh, but they are integrated with all the resources already available in the European research ecosystem, especially with the tools uh, coming from the science projects, uh, the science clusters, and the research infrastructures. And of course, uh, we are trying to do that involving the users. When it comes to the Infra EOSCO 7 project, the specific challenge that they were addressed to us to address was increasing the service offer of the EOSC portal, meaning equipping EOSC with a set of resources and services that can support the researchers. If we look at this in the big picture, so that's usually the schema that we use to design the main components of EOSC. And you see there is a core, there is an exchange, a data federation that can serve the entire RNI community. So EOSC Future is implementing the backbone while the O7 projects are enriching the EOSC ecosystem with services and resources. The main manifestation at this point in time of EOSC Future is what we call the EOSC platform that is showcased through the EOSC portal. You have the link on this slide. I'm not going to go into the details because you will see uh, some examples today and tomorrow during the presentation of the use cases. But this is just to say that uh, is an integrated catalog of services equipped with different functionalities. And the idea for the future is to provide this platform to all the researchers to facilitate their job. Finally, I mean, just to give you an idea of what are these services or resources that the Infra EOSCO 7 are providing, you have on this slide examples of these type of resources. So we are talking about compute infrastructures, data repositories, community dashboard, and so on. Again, I'm not going to go into other details because you will see that during the, uh, the webinar today and tomorrow. So today we stop at one o'clock and that's the agenda for tomorrow. Today we have uh, three main teams on the agenda. 
digital assets supporting climate action, supporting good health and well-being, and discovering services for open science. But before going into um, these sessions, so for this introduction, uh, we had two speakers, uh, Magdalena uh, Sposertsovska from DigiConnect C1, European Commission, and Marco Zennaro, Head of Science, Technology and Innovation Unit of UNESCO ICTV. Unfortunately, and that's why <laughs> we had a bit of delay, Magdalena couldn't join us this morning. And that's why before giving the word to Marco, uh, I'm just gonna guide you briefly through the slides that Magdalena shared with us. And by the way, I've just realized that I haven't introduced myself. <laughs> so uh, apologies for that, but uh, just to give you um, a couple of information. So my name is Sara Garavelli, I work at CSC, IT Center for Science in Finland. Uh, I'm involved in the EOSC Future Project, and I'm also one of the elected uh, directors in the EOSC Association. Uh, let's go briefly to the slides of Magda, very, very briefly, just to give you an idea of where these activities are co-located in, um, in the entire vision of the European Open Science Cloud. So for those familiar with the European data strategy and the data spaces, so the European Open Science Cloud, EOSC, has been defined as the horizontal uh, European data space, the one enabling a single market for data. Uh, what are the design principles for common European data spaces? So of course, there is there should be a governance, there should be interconnection uh, in a way to enable uh, international standards. So we are not reinventing the wheel, but interconnecting. Uh, we encourage actors to use common technical data infrastructure, and that's one of the main principles behind EOSC. Openness, respect for the European user values, and of course, data access and control. When it comes to the EOSC panorama, so we have seen that we have uh, EOSC Future and the Infra EOSC 07 together as an EOSC project implementing the EOSC. There are other initiatives promoted by DG Connect, like the smart middleware to support data spaces that will appear soon on the landscape uh, of the European landscape. So the smart middleware will be a software stack that provides common services and capabilities to data spaces. So this just to remark that EOSC is not acting alone. So there are several initiatives, especially promoted by the G Connect, that will complement what EOSC is doing. Uh, when it comes to EOSC, I, I just said that uh, now the EOSC phase one is completed, where we had uh, different grants, uh, Horizon 2020 course, like EOSC Future and uh, the Infra EOSC 07. Uh, we had an EOSC roadmap uh, and initial governance. What's happening next? So next, we have now a partnership uh, in Horizon Europe. We have a strategic research and innovation agenda and a new EOS governance that includes member states, the EOSC Association, and the community. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention is that in the EOSC uh, panorama, uh, we will have different implementations coming from the projects, uh, complemented by other initiatives. And for example, another initiative is uh, the Nation Earth, um, that is a flagship initiative of the Commission addressing the twin green and digital challenge. But in addition to that, uh, at the end, uh, before the end of the year, there will be also a new procurement that will be launched. And this procurement will be particularly fundamental for the future sustainability of EOSC. So these slides will be available online, so you can go through them um, in the next days. I still have the apologies from Magda uh, for not being with us, but now I really want to pass the floor to our next speaker, that is Marco Zennaro, Head of Science, Technology and Innovation Unit at UNESCO ICTV, that will guide us uh, uh, more into the open science area and the, the challenges. Marco, I stop sharing the screen. Okay. <clears throat> Let me see. Okay, there you go. So thank you very much, Sara. Thank you very much for the invitation. So my name is Marco Zanara. I'm head of the Science, Technology and Innovation Unit at the Abdul Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics, ICTP. And I want to present 
how these uh, technologies can support all research communities. So oh, just one slide about the CTP. It is a center which was founded in 1964 by the Nobel laureate Abdul Salam. And it's a category one UNESCO institution. So we're uh, a part of UNESCO and it's located in Trieste, Italy. So what Abdul Salam said when he received his Nobel prize in 79 was that scientific thought and its creation are the common heritage of mankind. So we can have different uh, you know, cultures, different religions, different political views. When we're talking about science, we're talking about the same thing. And the mission of ACTP uh, beyond carrying out research at the uh, highest level is to foster the growth of uh, advanced studies and research in physics and math, especially in support of excellence in developing countries. So when we're talking about open science, that's part of our DNA. So our scientists have been doing open science for long. Well, uh, you know, before recommendations uh, were uh, developed and open science is not considered an obligation, but in a way, an expression of the moral and financial responsibility to the global scientific community to advance science and the boundaries of human knowledge. So when we look at the, UNESCO recommendation of open science, as you know, it has many different uh, components. Uh, in fact, open access, so access to publication, just one, open data, which I'm sure we're going to cover in this uh, webinar is another one, but I want to focus on open infrastructures, what you read in the top right side of this figure. In fact, when you look at the recommendation, uh, it says that member states are encouraged to promote the uh, open science infrastructures to ensure uh, adequate investment in the reliable connectivity and bandwidth for use by scientists and science all over the world and to support entrants all over the world. And if you look at the first topic, connectivity and bandwidth, um, I want to focus on the specific case of Africa. And in particular, I want to show you this picture which shows the fiber optic cables, the undersea fiber optic cables, which connect the continent, especially to Europe. And there's two figures on the left, you see what was the status in 2010. So just, you know, 12 years ago and the status right now. You see that the thickness of these lines show the capacity. So in the picture on the left, it says gigabits. So the, you know, uh, thickness is limited to gigabits in, in some way. And as you can see, the picture on the right shows that there is many more connections and that the throughput is now in terms of terabits. So this is just to say that the capacity in the specific case of Africa has changed completely in the last 10 years. People often have the comment that uh, that is good for countries that are on the coast, but landlocked countries are in the, still in a bad uh, condition, but actually there's some exercises, for example, the one carried out by NSRC, where they try to map the terrestrial fiber optic cables. And you see that the network is expanding there as well. This is just to say that capacity in a continent like Africa has changed completely in the last 10 years. And although the European uh, Open Science Cloud is an environment to host and process research to support European science, it also works worldwide. And of course, it represents a very useful ecosystem for individual, for scientists, and also for universities all over the world. And in the case of ICTP, especially for, for developing countries. So I would like to say that the European Science Cloud is a common, a science common that contributes to building the heritage of what Abdul Salam referred to, right? When we're talking about, again, a science and technology, we're talking about a common heritage of, of mankind. We have been working with Reliance in the last, I would say two years. And we have been working with the scientific community and presenting use case scenarios in a number of uh, countries in Africa, in Rwanda, for example. And I think it's really interesting because it uh, tackles not only uh, SDG nine, so industry innovation and infrastructure, but it also brings added value to many other SDGs. So they're listed here, life below water, climate action, life on land, or making cities and settlements inclusive, safe, and resilient. And in addition to that, I think that the European Science Cloud and Reliance are enablers 
for some of the UNESCO recommendation key objectives, both in Europe and globally. So for instance, uh, investing in open science infrastructure, which we just mentioned, but also investing in human resources and capacity building in promoting innovative approaches for open science in different stages of the scientific process and promoting, of course, international and multi-stakeholder cooperation. So that is all from my side. Uh, thanks again, Sarah, and I wish you a very successful uh, two days of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, for, for your presentation. I think it was really nice to see also, I mean, con the um, contextualization of EOSC in a more global uh, context. So I mentioned different initiatives going on at European level, but of course, if we don't work international, I mean, that's not going to work. So I don't see any questions in Slido, but maybe uh, I want to ask you something because uh, I think your experience, uh, it's very interesting. I mean, UNESCO is a bit, if you want an outsider uh, of the proper or the official formal EOSC, but you have collaborated with Reliance. So what was your experience in this collaboration? So did you find it useful? What worked best? It's uh, extremely positive. In the case of Rwanda, I think it, it the, um... Um, the seminars were tackled to PhD students. And I think that, you know, tackling early careers scientists is extremely useful because they have, of course, all their career in front of them. So learning about these, you know, technologies and concepts and principles is even more valuable, I would say. So that was an added value of working with, with Reliance. Okay, so this is something that you recommend for maybe future projects uh, to pursue this kind of actions. Okay. Definitely, yes. Thank you very much. So now I'm Thanks. just asking the audience if there are any questions for, for Marco or in general uh, about this webinar. Otherwise, we can move to the next session. So if you want to ask a question directly, you can raise your hand in Zoom. Otherwise, I will ask my colleague to put up the slides for the next session, and uh, which will be on digital assets supporting the climate action. And I want to introduce the chair for the next session, that is Charis Chatsi Kiriako. I hope I got it right. <laughs> Project manager at the Heart Observation Data Center for Water Resource Monitoring. So Charis, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and let me restore my <laughs> name and surname. So I am Haris Kadzikiriaku. I work as a project manager at the Earth Observation Data Center in, in Austria, in Vienna. And I'm also uh, the coordinator of one of the uh, infra EOS 07 projects that Sarah mentioned earlier, the one called C-Scale. Um, so the following uh, sessions focus on specific um, UN sustainable development goals, uh, as it was mentioned, and more specifically in climate action, in industry innovation and infrastructure, and good health and well-being. Um, we start with uh, the one focusing on climate action. Uh, sorry, Federica, you can mute yourself. or I did it, I guess, uh, sorry. So um, in this first session, we will have six use cases presented, um, two from C-Scale, uh, two from Reliance, one from EGIS and one from EOSC Future. Um, here you can see our speakers, but I will introduce each one of them when uh, their turn comes uh, anyway. And same as before, uh, you can find here the code for Slido and the password. Please enter your uh, questions during the during the the speakers present their use cases, and I will be monitoring. At the end of each uh, use case presented, we will have a short few minutes uh, Q and A session. Uh, so feel free to enter your your questions. And we start with the first speaker. Um, who is uh, Milut Milenkovic. Uh, Milut is a research scholar in the Novel Data Ecosystems for Sustainability Research Group uh, in IASA in the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis uh, in, uh, also in Vienna, Austria. 
uh, but he's also an associated researcher in the Geoinformation Science and Remote Sensing Lab at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. So uh, Milutin, whenever you are ready, uh, you can start your presentation. Yes, thank you. Hi, morning. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen uh, and uh, hope that works. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, yeah, so. Great. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming on uh, my presentation. Yeah, so uh, I would like first to introduce my collaborators. It's Raymond Donk, Wanda de Kasmaka, Johannes Eiche, Martin Harold, and, and Jan Verbesselt. <laughs> So we all work together on uh, on a return use case, uh, which is a part of the of the C scale project, and uh, it's about monitoring uh, uh, Amazon rainforest uh, recovery capacity with uh, terabytes of satellite images yeah, on EOC infrastructure. Yeah, so my my research is uh, about uh, tropical forest resilience, and uh, here you can see that there is a, a, a one approach to that, to looking at a an, an non-disturbed forest, so like intact forest, and uh, there is a, a professor from Wageningen University, very famous one, and and he uh, he introduced a, a kind of uh, of a theory for. Uh, uh, ecosystem functioning and uh, uh, that is under the increasing pressure and and we can see that uh, uh, the functioning is uh, declining over the time uh, uh, up to the certain point where it uh, the changes are not anymore linear but really non-linear changes and it, it changed the state so that that practically means that uh, tropical forests can turn to savanna or if you are if you are observing savanna it can turn to the desert so that's that's really uh, the point of of no return and and the main question actually around is uh, what are the indicators uh, how far we are from this point uh, of of no return in in a tropical forest yeah, an alternative approach to to looking at the tropical forest resilience is to to observe the the disturbed patches of the forest and and how they recover. And if we see that uh, recovery, uh, if we look at, for example, at the time series, and we see some some uh, faster recovery of uh, of a forest, then then we are speaking about the high resilience, and 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 we are if we are observing some some slower or prolongated uh, uh, recovery of of tropical forest and then we are speaking about uh, low resilience of, of tropical forest and and this is exactly what this use case is about uh, about those uh, uh, disturbance recovery uh, patterns and we uh, we are observing those disturbance recovery patterns from the satellite image time series so those satellite image time series are usually uh, related to the, some uh, par, uh, forest parameters such as biomass and, and then we have a disturbance event and then we are looking at, at the recovery and yeah of course so there are different indices uh, introduced how to monitor that so like the recovery time the magnitude of the recovery the the magnitude of the impact the speed of recovery and yeah, so so those are all parameters we can derive from from uh, uh, a satellite image time series, and and we have several research questions. But one of the 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 first and apparent research question was uh, how uh, what are the big data approaches we 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 can uh, we can use to to answer this question because. You know, if we if we have disturbance recovery process only on on one uh, on one spot, that's that's not enough. We we need to look at uh, at a large area and statistically analyze a, a lot of of, of such such uh, uh, events, and and then then deduce something about uh, about the whole Amazon basin, for example. Yeah, and and uh, and on the other hand, those spots are really small. Yeah, so we need high resolution data. So very so very detailed images so so this means a, a large amount of data yeah and uh, in our study we use the sentinel one this is a space borne uh, radar satellite and this is how the image of the disturbed forest looks like so you can see some uh, uh, fish bone uh, disturbance patterns here uh, observable and and here you can see the time series in a gray that is like disturbed time series and here is of, of the the green is non-disturbed forest 
and and yeah on 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 this figure here you can already see yeah so that's it's almost a, yeah, already a famous figure from professor professor Wagner from Tel Vienna where where we can uh, actually see that very easily just after one year we uh, end up with with uh, terabytes of data of of, of sentinel one satellite images to to analyze and and of course in 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 a time series approach is, is not only about one year it's a, about monitoring several years yeah, and uh, th this is the analysis framework we introduced. So we have some history period where we uh, where we are observing how the signal uh, should look like before the disturbance, and then then we have a monitoring period where where we see this disturbance recovery pattern, and and then we derive certain parameters like magnitude, total time of recovery, some partial pre uh, pre disturbance post post disturbance uh, recoveries and changing of the signals and 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 uh, yeah so one one question is how are those parameters so related to one another what are their statistical properties and another question is like this this time series you can see here is is like nicely behaving time series so with a clear disturbance recovery pattern but we have also different cases uh, uh, around and we we wanted to map all those cases and and also to provide some spatial map of it with those different categories of, of time series yeah and first we started uh, doing all those uh, calculations on, on local servers and yeah, we split some uh, analysis area this is just small part of uh, brazilian state or donia and and then we use Google Earth Engine to fetch some data and introduced a lot of uh, Python code around to end up in in such kind of a regular data cube. So six day Sentinel one uh, data cube with disturbance recovery features and and this was the base then to to do a kind of statistical analysis or to do the mapping or just to visualize some time series and and and, and understand uh, how the signal behaves there. Yeah, and with the C-scale approach, we we basically uh, uh, replace this data component with uh, uh, taking the the data from 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 data pro provider EUDC from Vienna, and then we transfer the data to the computing infrastructure. So this is the Dutch National uh, Computing Infrastructure Surf which is uh, a part of EUSC. And, and basically this analysis is, is then done at, at, at this computing infrastructure. And yeah, so, so we use, uh, yeah, this is about technologies we use. So we, we use our clone to transfer the data. And, uh, and, and this, this is a user environment uh, that we build on, on surf infrastructure, so Jupyter Notebooks, where we can uh, develop uh, some piece of Python code around that. And, and, and then we use the Slurm to, to upscale uh, the analysis. Yeah, and, and the data, yeah, this is important to mention, the data from EODC, they were provided in, in, in some Equi-7 grid. This is 300 by 300 kilometers tiles. So you can see it's it's a piles of images from each of those tiles. Yeah, and in, within a C-scale uh, computational setup, we introduced actually two levels of indexing. So this original native uh, uh, Equi-7 grid tiles of 300 by 300 kilometers, but we also had the processing chunks of 1,000 by 1,000 uh, pixels. And yeah, so at the end, we end up with uh, more than 18 billion pixels to, to, to apply this uh, time series analysis. And yeah, long long story short, uh, it, it it will cost us at the end so 0.6 million CPU hours and about 40 days in uh, total calculation. So so we are just uh, about in, in in next weeks actually we will we will just initiate this whole processing. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, to to show some preliminary results and, and as you can see the uh, the analysis is able to depict this uh, uh, fishbone uh, uh, disturbance pattern and 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 we are already observing some functional relationship between uh, disturbance and the recovery pattern so uh, yeah and of course we are looking forward to derive this over over the whole Amazon basin yeah. Yeah, so some uh, lessons learned, hopefully, with uh, from this exercise. So we we were 
So it's it's very important to understand, you know, when, when transferring the data, if we have a running archive from the data provider, because if the, the archive is running, then we are getting more and more data and our code has to be adopted to that. So of course we have to count that some that some of the files we are transferring, they maybe end up corrupted or or that there are simply different uh properties of the data due, uh, due to the different pre-processing, so different scaling, or even, uh, you know, when you are preparing your uh, Python code, for example, to, to process all this data, uh, one should think about the concur uh, concurrent jobs uh, when uh, during the upscaling, be because there may appear some issues with uh, concurrent, uh, for example, writing in the same folder and so on. So, yeah, those are some of the things uh, we uh, we were actually dealing on the fly. And as a, as a final slide, uh, what I can say, yeah, so th this is more or less stable um, uh, comparing the C scale approach we done with uh, with uh, different existing approaches, OpenEO platform and then Google Earth Engine. So those are also different ways of of doing a large scale. Uh, uh, computation and analysis with the satellite data. And, and what is really nice with the C-scale is that it's it's very flexible. So user can can really design their workflow as, as they like. And uh, the upscaling is manual, which is uh, for, for some users, it, it could be disadvantage, but actually I think it's really advantage because uh, the debugging is simply much faster, you know, and if, if something doesn't work, so so user is is uh, is having a chance to 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 change the the code and 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 really do this uh, upscaling or uh, as as he or she wish. Yeah, and uh, reproducibility is, is 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 fully so the, the whole workflow is totally reproducible. So so of course, uh, yeah, we should mention actually that uh, all the data and the code that we will provide within this C scale use case will will be freely available to everyone, and 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 basically all the results we calculate uh, are are fully reproducible. Yeah, and maybe as a, as a as a small drawback of of the C scale approach is this data transfer that is required, and and sometimes for for a researcher it's a, it just takes a bit more time than than necessary to deal with all those issues. So this 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 is maybe uh, aspect of of the C scale that that can be improved. Yeah. So yeah, with that I would like to to finish my uh, talk, and yeah, thank you very much for for attention. Thank you very much, Milutin, for your presentation on return. Um, so I see a question on Slido from Dale. Um, I guess it's for you, Milutin. So uh, yeah. how aware are you whilst doing, doing your work that you're using EOS? And if you were aware, what was the experience like? Good, less good, other. Yeah, so yeah, from from I, I was basically aware of, of the time using EOSC, but uh, uh, since uh, a lot of, of this work is also done in collaboration with the Dutch National Infrastructure Surf, I was mostly collaborating with them. So uh, and they are the the partners of of EOSC and and yeah so that's from through this connection I was aware but uh, yeah so uh, that's 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 basically that was basically the connection and uh, yeah but it didn't uh, burden me uh, let's say in my in my work uh, that that I was thinking about that yeah so like uh, it was mostly. Yeah, through through the communication with uh, with uh, surf uh, partners. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dale, for your question. And then we have Elisa. Hello, good morning. Uh, thanks, uh, Milutin, for your. Uh, presentation. I have a um, technical question, actually, a scientific question. I was just curious um, on why you, um, you're you using C-band satellite, so MVSAT and Sentinel. I was wondering why you don't use X-band or L-band for your uh, kind of study. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. 
Yeah, so let me go back, uh, yeah, to this slide. So, of, uh, yeah, the C band, uh, it's, um, uh, this is, uh, uh, first of all, I use uh, uh, Copernicus data because they are free and open, yeah, and, uh, and it's a very novel sensor, so that's that's why that's that's the main uh, let's say the main reason but of course uh, the the drawback of c band is that uh, uh, you know like this uh, uh, recovery curve can uh, if we compare with uh, x uh, with with the l band could be faster yeah because it's uh, it's it's known that, uh, that the c band is uh, can saturate the, the bio a bit, uh, bit, a bit a bit of the biomass yeah and and those are actually the other research questions that we have so it's not only that the recovery of the satellite signal doesn't mean the recovery of the forest yeah and uh, and that's why uh, we are doing also different kind of studies to relate uh, uh, the different uh, features of the C scale of the C band uh, uh, satellites uh, to to the recovery of the forest. Yeah, but yeah, just just to repeat again, uh, I, I use the C band because yeah, now uh, the Copernicus data are freely available, and uh, yeah, for for other data, I would have to pay. Actually, that's uh, that's probably the the bottom line. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Elisa, for your question, and uh, Milutin, thank you for answering and for your presentation. We will move on to the next speaker now, um, just to stick to the to the time. Um, our next speaker is Arjen um, van Haag. Um, Arjen is a hydrologist and remote sensing analyst at the Department of Operational Water Management and Early Warning uh, at Deltares and he will present us the Aqua Monitor use case. So Arjen, whenever you are ready, you can start sharing your screen. Ah, oh, there you are. There I am, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, here we go. Okay, one back. Uh, thank you and uh, welcome. Um, I already heard that um, there will be a few things uh, similar as to the previous uh, presentation, so I'll try to skip over those quickly um, because this is also about uh, Google Earth Engine and C scale, uh, OpenEO, uh, et cetera, but a very different case. So there, there should be some new things in there as well. Um, as you can see from the title, indeed, this is about um, us uh, porting the Aqua Monitor, a specific application I'll uh, describe later, um, from Google Earth Engine to the OpenEO backend. And uh, this is uh, done within the C scale project. Um, and I am here uh, as a representative of Deltaris, but as you can see at the top, uh, there's a huge list of uh, other parties involved. Um, so um, yeah, very important. But let's get on, uh, we only have uh, about 10 minutes. Um, this is the Aqua Monitor, uh, as you would see it if you would go to the website on the top left. And uh, this is uh, already six years old now, actually. Um, first constructed in 2016 um, by mostly uh, colleagues of mine. And um, what you can see here, it is uh, water that has turned into land, which is visualized in green, and land that has turned into water, which is visualized in blue, um, over the course of uh, the entire uh, Landsat satellite uh, mission. Uh, so that in this case, it is the last uh, 35 years, uh, roughly speaking. And um, well, you can check all kinds of interesting patterns here. Uh, there are a few I would like to highlight specifically because this session is about uh, climate action. So, uh, well, the thing that of course stands out most and that everybody probably knows about is the Aral Sea drying up, which is not only about the climate, uh, of course, it's also about uh, human interventions. Um, but perhaps more about the climate is you can see all these various lakes forming over the Tibetan plateau. Um, and well, that could of course be 
due to uh, global or in their case local uh, warming. Um, but there is a lot of other things you can uh, see from here. You can see a lot of uh, man-made reservoirs pop up, for example. You can see droughts in certain areas where a lot of water is disappearing. Um, but um, in order for me to really say what's going on, I'm taking you a bit closer to home, uh, to my own country of the Netherlands. Um, there's not that much going on at first glance, but if you zoom in, uh, there's some interesting patterns you can see. Um, because this also allows you to really zoom into local detail. So, for example, in the north, uh, in the Netherlands, we have this uh, natural mudflat sea called the Wadden Sea. Um, and while all, most of these islands, they are inhabited, they still have a sort of semi-natural coastline. Uh, and that's also what you can see here. So you can see patterns where uh, the coastline has, well, uh, eroded, but also uh, a lot of um, sedimentation or accretion has happened, sometimes with human interventions, um, with uh, beach nourishments, uh, which you can also see below. Um, so on that example on the bottom, we can see two uh, great cases. The first is uh, our first huge uh, building with nature beach nourishment. Um, dubbed the sand engine, where instead of um, over a large area sand is being deposited, they just de deposit a huge area of sand in one location and just let nature take its course and distribute the sand further along the coast, um, which has been a huge success um, so far. Um, and a little bit less um, about the climate, perhaps, uh, you can see the expansion of the port of Rotterdam as well, um, where this huge area has been created uh, and extends the harbor further into the sea. <clears throat> uh, I think this is a great case of what, well, the things you can see with this aqua monitor, uh, both man-based but also natural changes. Uh, and as of now, this uh, is of course um, done in Google Earth Engine, um, as also described in the previous uh, presentation. And um, well, one of the great things of Earth Engine is, of course, the, the readily available data sets um, in there. And this is probably already old. Uh, it mentions over five petabytes of data. I think they're already above six right now. Um, and um, well, what, what is, or at least what used to be uh, unique uh, about Earth Engine is that everything is in this one environment. So you have your, your data, your storage, your compute, your algorithm primitives and everything in one location, uh, which can make it very efficient. Um, but of course, it also has its downsides. Um, I hope you don't see this bar that now suddenly popped up at the top um, that I am seeing. We don't, we don't. OK, I do. good. Thanks. Then I'll just continue. Um, now, moving on to C-Scale, I don't know how much has been presented on C-Scale uh, already. I'm afraid I uh, only joined uh, 15 minutes ago. Um, but yeah, the basic idea is to uh, federate European uh, Earth observation uh, infrastructure and services. Um, and then also, of course, um, yeah, work together with uh, EOSC. <clears throat> And there's various objectives within the project, uh, which I won't go into now because we simply don't have the time for it. So I'll just highlight those relevant um, for this use case. And that is, um, well, as you can see here, piloting uh, a distributed long-term archive um, would definitely be one of them. And very specifically, it's about, um, yeah, the use cases itself. And well, here we see uh, six use cases. We also see the return use case, uh, the second from the bottom, from the word that was just represented um, before me. And um, well, I am now, of course, talking about the Aqua Monitor one. And what has been done? Well, this has mostly been work um, by um, two of my colleagues. And uh, what they did is they constructed this architecture you can see here on the left uh, to implement the Aqua Monitor algorithm, <clears throat> ported away from Earth Engine um, and implemented in the OpenEO um, with the Python client library. <laughs> so that meant that all of the yeah, predetermined uh, Earth Engine algorithms, um, which you can so easily use there, had to be sort of deconstructed and ported into uh, generic Python um, using geospatial Python packages, uh, things like XRA uh, mainly, and uh, make sure it's suitable for uh, OpenEO. 
And uh, aside from that, um, we have also uh, made sure that there are um, notebooks available, simplistic notebook explaining it, but also one that has been used uh, previously in a uh, course. Uh, so you have questions and answers in there to really help you learn, um, well, both how Aqua Monitor itself works, uh, so more the technical implementation of it, uh, or the conceptual implementation, maybe even. Uh, but also the open EO backend, how does this function? Uh, how can you query your images? How can you process them, uh, et cetera? And um, yeah, I think it's quite informative uh, in that sense. Um, uh, well, one thing I should mention, you can uh, check this out also at the Cscale GitHub page uh, here shown in the bottom left, um, which is all uh, openly accessible. Um, then we got to the lessons learned. And um, well, one of the most uh, challenging things here, um, probably similar to the previous presentation, is that this uses a huge data set um, in total, uh, multiple petabytes, uh, I believe. And um, yeah, this has to be calculated fast. You don't want to uh, wait hours or days for your results to show. So that does present significant challenges um, for storage, access, compute, etc. Um, and again, that also depends, of course, on the OpenEO backend, how that is used. I won't go into the very detailed specifics now, but um, what you should know is that what we use as OpenEO backend, it uh, has most data in memory to do calculations. So, that, of course, um, you can't really store the entire Landsat archive directly in your memory. That, that simply won't work, at least not at scale. Um, so that was an interesting challenge. Um, and as such, we also... Um, decided uh, together with the OpenEO backend provider that we will do a proof of concept version. Um, so we haven't um, created the app, replicated the application as it is on Google Earth Engine, which is at scale globally, but we've scaled it down in spatial temporal uh, sense. So uh, it does reproduce um, the Aqua Monitor, but within a limited um, spatial temporal scale. And then theoretically, you can of course then scale that up um, but that also means that your backend uh, should be suitable for that. And um, well, that is something that could be done, but we haven't um, done this at the moment uh, because it was also not the goal of this use case. And a few things in general uh, that we can then highlight. Um, well, you can uh, port uh, ERC engine algorithms uh, successfully to OpenEO um, with the Python client library, but probably also with their other available libraries. Uh, it has a huge potential, but um, there are some things at the moment um, where GE uh, still outperforms it, um, which is also not that strange because GE has been around for much longer. It's a much more mature service. Um, so it's, it's not that surprising, of course. Um, and as also highlighted nicely um, in the table in the previous uh, presentation, um, OpenEO does give users more flexibility. So you have more control over your uh, parallelization, for example, um, and you can choose from uh, multiple programming languages or interfaces, while with uh, something like uh, Earth Engine, you're more restricted in that, which has its pros and cons also, um, of course. And that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to uh, answer some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Arjen, um, for your presentation. I do not see any questions on Slido. Uh, and in the chat, neither. So I would like to ask the audience if you have any questions. You can either write them in Slido or in the chat or raise your hands as uh, happened earlier. And if there's nothing around, we will just move to the next presentation. Fair enough. You don't see anything either, right? <laughs> okay. No, all good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arjen. Um, thank you, Charis. So we move on to the next presentation uh, by Federica Foyini, I guess. Yes, good morning, everybody. <laughs> you can restore your name as well afterwards. Um, 
Federica will present us the sea pollution, loss of biodiversity and sustainability. And she's a marine data scientist at the, at the Institute of Marine Science in Bologna. Um, so please go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, I will share my screen. Uh, I cannot share. Let me see because you, I'm not able to. Okay. It says that the organizer, yeah. <laughs> so, you should be able okay, to. Now, now it's fine. Okay. Now it's fine, yeah. Let me share the screen. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm presenting you a case study of the Reliance project related to sea pollution, loss of biodiversity and sustainability. Before going in the case studies itself, I would like to provide a short overview about the Reliance services. Reliance is an horizontal project included into EOSC and uh, it's contributed to the EOSC exchange with a set of different services. In particular, we are going to focus on the concept of research object Haroha, that is the city on the uh, advanced geospatial data management platform that is a way of easily access selecting and discovering a, a huge amount of earth science data and also Later on, we are going to demonstrate the text mining services that is enriching our case studies. So I wanted to focus on the concept of the research object that I need to introduce before going to the case study. The research object is a way of encapsulating the different components of the research life cycle in a unique object starting from data, workflows, models, softwares, presentation, and articles. This research object can be acknowledged and shared through different other services and platforms, for example, through Zenodo or B2Share, and are stored in this Arrowhub repository. Arrowhub represents also the central point of all Reliance services and other EOS services. So through Reliance, we can access the different services and we can of course, do uh, many different things, uh, starting from selecting data to process data to store and share our data. In the Reliance uh, project, there were different scientific communities, and I'm representing the sea monitoring communities made of uh, marine geologists, biologists, geologists. So it's a multidisciplinary community that is facing many scientific problems, such as the influence of climate change of ocean circulations, uh, marine ecosystems systems and habitats and their ecology and natural and anthropogenic factors impacting economically and socially coastal systems and deep sea environments. I will focus on the marine ecosystems and habitats and their ecology with the scientific cases that I'm presenting here in a nutshell. So I want to present the case studies of mapping the photic zone of the Mediterranean Sea, estimating the penetration of light along the water column from satellite data to map the photic zone. So what does it mean and why it's so important? Mapping the photic zone allows us to uh, estimate and to evaluate the presence of uh, highly vulnerable habitats that should be protected. And for doing so, we need uh, some specific data such as the KD490 and the photosynthetically active radiation, uh, radiation PAR at sea surface in order to identify the areas suitable for the presence of this ecological relevant habitat. Before uh, going to a demonstration where I will show you how these uh, Reliance services are enabling us to facilitate our life, I wanted to focus on the technical requirements we had. First of all, an easy access to this data, an easy access to processing the data, to storing the results, to share the data and make the data and product fair. Reliance together with IELTS is enabling a lot of these issues and in particular is simplifying a lot our day-to-day -day work guaranteeing an effective services for long-term scientific knowledge to preserve our scientific publication and to providing easy data accessibility and in particular what we are very aware about is to making science repeatable and reusable but how are we doing all of this? 
So this is the workflow showing the uh, this case studies that I will in a, in a minute uh, present through a video. So we can uh, look for different research objects, the one that we need uh, using specific keywords uh, through the European Open Science Cloud, in particular the Open Air Services for Searching Scientific Products. We can then be redirected to this Aro Hub, exploring the research object and the Aro Hub services with HEOSC. So when we are in Aro Hub, we can uh, straight away go to the Adam platform for selecting and choosing the satellite data before using this AGI bundler that is giving us the possibility of um, uh, creating a virtual machine to run our codes and model. And the codes and model that we're gonna show now needs for assessing the existence of this vulnerable habitat that are uh, very much uh, uh, under pressure and that we need to protect. So let's see this very, short video with a demonstration of these case studies. So here you can go through the EOSC marketplace in the discovery services and select the research objects that are visible. For example, here I wanted to know if there is a research object dealing with this mapping the photic zone. I just need to write some keywords and here I can search and I see exactly this mapping the photic zone of the Mediterranean, and this is a research object. Clicking on the name of, the, of, of, of this uh, object, I can be redirected to the Haro Hub, and uh, clicking on Haro Hub, I will open straight away the Haro Hub services. And here you see how is a research object, how it looks like. First of all, I can log in with the AGI login. This is very important because it's a common uh, login, so you don't need a specific account. But if you are already logged in for AGI, you can access the Haro Hub platform. And here you can explore the research object. Here you see an overview with uh, uh, the image I already shown you, and you see the content. The content is made of uh, bibliographic information. In particular, here you have a link to another paper. This is a PhD thesis that is describing completely what uh, uh, you see here. Uh, I, I'm sorry, this is a paper that has been published recently about these specific case studies. Here you have the input data. We have two links. Here it is the ocean color data, the MODIS Equa KD49. And I can open this uh, this data through the Adam platform. This is the Adam platform, how it looks like. So I can just go in the data I choose from the Haro Hub. Uh, here you see I'm loading this ocean color modis aqua data. I can focus on the geographical area of interest. In particular, I wanted to focus on the North Adriatic, and, uh, and then this will be my input data for further processing. Then this is the uh, Jupyter Notebook I'm going to use for running my model. Here there is a description of the Jupyter Notebook, and I can open straight away the Jupyter Notebook from the Haro Hub opening this AGI binder. Why the binder now is so useful for us? Because you can create your own machine as a virtual machine. So storing all your library for your program programming languages, for example, this code was implemented in R. So there is no need to reinstall all the library in another framework, in another context. But you can uh, straight away have the mirror of your computer in this AGI binder. So uh, now the AGI AGI is open. Uh, here I have uh, different steps of my uh, algorithm where I'm importing data, selecting data, uh, running the code, and the plotting the results, and then export the results as a GeoTIFF, and it will be uh, incorporated again in the research object. So uh, I can go on. Uh, I finished my demonstration. Thanks a lot. And I hope uh, if you have any question, I'm here. Thank you very much, Federica, for your demo. It was really nice. Thank you. Uh, 
So on Slido, I don't see anything yeah. and in the chat either for now. Okay. Yeah, so I guess it was all very clear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. And if you have any further questions, you can contact me directly about this uh, case study. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we will move on then to the next speaker, uh, which is Anne Fuyo from the University of Oslo, uh, who will present the next uh, use case on climate change from Reliance. Uh, just very quick to say that Anne is a senior research engineer at uh, Simula Research Laboratory in Oslo. Uh, Anne, the floor is yours. You can start sharing your screen. Um, I think someone is uh, sharing the slides and then I will have a short demo where I'll share. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, so first, before I start, I wanted to say that uh, EOSC is very important when you change institution because uh, it is very smooth and easy. You can reuse the same services. You don't have to do anything because as Federica explained, you still keep your uh, same way of authenticating to the, all the services. So I will not repeat what uh, Federica has shown, but um, I will focus on one of the use case in the Reliance, which is about uh, seasonal sea ice forecasting. Next slide, please. So this is the overview of uh, my talk. I will uh, give you a short introduction to the use case, a scenario for the demo, and then the demo. Next slide. So uh, why uh, it is important to focus on seasonal Arctic sea ice forecasting? Um, we would like to uh, better plan, find safer routes, and reduce operational costs of navigating in the Arctic. As you may know, uh, sea ice is uh, melting a lot in the Arctic, so it's a uh, um, it, it is seen as a, an opportunity for some, but it is also a threat from o for others, in particular for local communities. So it is really important to understand and minimize the impact on the environment, but also to provide and onboard uh, communities that can have their say on how it should be done and uh, on the impact, for instance, on the biodiversity. So we need to engage with the ecologists and biodiversity scientists. Next slide, please. So this is a use case scenario. We started from uh, an open access paper. Uh, that, uh, it has been published uh, in Nature Communications by Tim Anderson. And uh, in this paper, they have developed a, a new methodology called IceNet, a probabilistic deep learning method uh, for seasonal sea ice forecasts. So in this paper, the data, the codes are available and can be reused. It means they have the proper license but it is not a research object yet. So what we have done, if you move to the next. Yeah, so Alejandro uh, Coca-Castro is uh, from the Turing Institute in UK, and he was an early adopter of the Reliance Services, and he created a research object based on the paper and showing how to use this IceNet deep neural network to make se a seasonal sea ice forecast. Uh, next. If you click, uh, I guess, yeah. So this is an executable research object and this is a Jupyter notebook. Next. So then I forked this uh, research object because I would like to create derivative work. And in particular, I would like to be uh, to make it more accessible, but from a, a human point of view for a uh, community that are outside uh, uh, this uh, climate uh, uh, community. Next. I also onboarded uh, Jean Quinta and is also part of Reliance. And is, uh, uh, for instance, at the beginning, he created a bibliographical research object. And now we are all working together on improving the Jupyter notebook. Next. Um, you can click on the next. Um, yeah, so what we are using in, the, in this collaborative work, we use EGI notebooks and the EGI data hub for sharing uh, the data and also for uh, sharing the computational environment. And we are developing uh, uh, derivative work. Uh, if you click on the next. Um, so in my setting in Rohub, I'm using B2Drop for my research object. So I'm storing the Jupyter notebook and the results in B2Drop. 
So I, I can easily share while doing. Every time I update my uh, Jupyter notebook in uh, EGI notebook, it is uh, uh, added uh, and updated in my research object. Next. Um, so we can create derivative work uh, from it. If you click on the next, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and they still have all the collaborators. Uh, and it is still uh, reusable and reproducible because uh, we can also use the EGI bander as explained by uh, Federica before. Next. Uh, this is a text mining enrichment service, which I will also show in the uh, uh, quickly show in, in the demo. And uh, I think it is very important for supporting interdisciplinary research and facilitate reuse. So for instance, here on the right hand side, you can uh, see uh, different uh, discovered metadata. So this is not the metadata I have added. This is discovered by this text uh, enrichment uh, service. Um, and in the dark green, we have, for instance, the domain. And uh, in uh, the field of research, are uh, in the light blue. And there are different types of categories, so location, and uh, a time reference, uh, the time reference is in uh, light green. So for instance, here is six months, and it can help other communities to uh, uh, understand better the content of the research object. And I will also show you in this tab, the enrichment, if you click on the next, uh, and we will have additional information about the text enrichment. Uh, next. Okay, so now you can stop sharing and I will stop, uh, I will try to share my uh, uh, video. Um, just hopefully here, and I will show you quickly how it works. Uh, so hopefully it will be a good quality. Let me know if there is any problem. But I will start from this uh, research object from uh, Alejandro Coca Castro, and I will uh, uh, fork this uh, Jupyter notebook. I mean, this is an executable research object by clicking on the fork button. So here, this is a sketch I'm uh, showing. Um, it has all the different uh, input, outputs, and the tools with the Conda environment and the Jupyter notebook. When I click here on the evolution, I can fork the research object. And I can update, for instance, the title and the description to, uh, to correspond to what I will develop and uh, create from this uh, original research object. Uh, so here I will pass a new description, and then I will click on the fork and continue. So it takes a bit of time to, uh, to fork a research object, depending on the content of uh, your research object. Um, then I, we will skip and we will go back to the EGI notebook. I will uh, show you uh, how it looks like when I work on the EGI notebook. I will start it and uh, I don't have to authenticate because I already authenticate earlier. I'm still using my ORCID identifier when I authenticate. And uh, here the Jupyter notebook is uh, opening. Um, and I will show you in the B2 drop uh, folder. Initially, there is uh, nothing for my research object because Alejandro doesn't use B2 drop. So I will uh, add. Uh, some Jupyter notebooks, a Jupyter notebook uh, that is uh, originally created by Alejandro. And we will see that as soon as I add a, a Jupyter notebook in my uh, research object on uh, EGI notebook, it will also appear on a row hub. Um, so I, I'm really sharing while doing, which is closer to uh, the open science paradigm. So here I created two folders that were not initially created. And in the tool folder, I will upload a Jupyter notebook. So I will uh, upload two Jupyter notebooks uh, so we can see that they are on, uh, on the research object. So this is the first one. This is a, a, a simpler one. And this is a, a more complex one where we uh, added some more context and more information about uh, sea ice and uh, uh, the uh, impact on, uh, on the climate. There is also some video to help uh, uh, other community to better understand what we are working on. Um, and I, uh, we execute this uh, Jupyter notebook, so uh, it is uh, still running. I'm sharing all the data in, uh, in the, the EGI data hub, but also 
in the resource here, yeah, you can see the two Jupyter notebook I added in my DP to drop folder. They just appeared. Um, so now it's still running, executing. And when I will generate some output, some plots, they will also be deposited in my B2Drop folder on EGI uh, notebook. And they will also be added automatically as files in uh, my research object. So it's really sharing while doing. So here, this is uh, showing the new plots we have generated. It's an interactive visualization, so we can change the dates for the different forecasts and the lead time um, to uh, check the accuracy of the forecast. Uh, and in the output folder, uh, we have two new generated files, and this is what we will see here. And I can also update the type of uh, this resource from a file, which is a default when we put in a B2Drop, to a sketch. So my research object will uh, now have a new sketch, so a new visual from the front page. Yeah, you can see. Um, and this is uh, uh, done as soon as I am creating and adding information in my research object. We'll uh, see on the right hand side some uh, metadata here um, at our discovered. And here this is this text enrichment section where we have more information, much more detail, different topics. And uh, we also have, uh, um, I will show, uh, yes, it's a different uh, type of uh, uh, topics, but uh, also, uh, I think later on, I will, uh, yeah, I will change to key elements and we'll see the sentences, but we'll also see the lemmas and uh, they will be highlighted in the description here. And I think this is the end of my demonstration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for your demonstration. Uh, are there any questions from the audience for Anne? I don't see anything on Slido. in the chat neither. Yeah, I mean, as Federica said, you can uh, uh, always reach out uh, any Reliance members and we would be very happy to onboard you and explain you further. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, in that case, we continue with the next speaker, uh, who is Christian Paget. Uh, Christian will present uh, the next use case uh, on the NS data space. And he works at Serifax as a high-level research engineer for climate data distribution infrastructures with a focus on big data issues. Uh, and whenever you're ready, Christian, uh, you can start. We can already see your screen. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction, introduction and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. So um, in this presentation, I will present you what we uh, uh, did for a use case uh, specifically to um, build actionable climate products for end users. And um, in this use case, we use uh, EGIS resources in the context of uh, EOSC. So the, uh, I will talk a little bit about EGIS first, because um, this is the platform we used uh, for this uh, specific use case. Um, the EGIS is a, a project that uh, implements a compute platform for EOSC and uh, it contributes to the EOSC data commons also uh, uh, with this uh, platform. Uh, it delivers integrated computing, uh, data space and tools as an integrated solution that is aligned with major European Cloud Federation projects and HPC initiatives. So uh, this is really uh, uh, important to have this uh, integration of the of different projects uh, uh, within this context. So the project overview of uh, EGIAs, uh, it has a budget of 12 million with a EC contribution of 8 million. Uh, it is uh, coordinated by um, EGI and uh, there are 33 partners, 20 
uh, three third parties. So the effort is really significant and a large part of it is uh, for virtual access, providing services and uh, tools, uh, large number of providers. And it will end um, in June, 2023. So to go uh, directly into the use case, um, I'll explain uh, why this idea has emerged uh, as a use case. Um, in fact, my work involved providing data to end users. So it can be users of uh, in different uh, scientific domains. And um, the climate data itself, so we are talking about here the climate modeling data, so for the future climate uh, simulations. Uh, it is distributed uh, using the Earth System Grid Federation, so it's an international federation uh, with uh, uh, several data nodes distributed uh, throughout the world. And um, uh, the, those data nodes provide some interface to access directly uh, the data sets, but it's not really straightforward to use for non-expert users, especially users outside of climate domain uh, data, uh, the climate domain. And um, also what is made available to those data nodes are, uh, it's not totally true that it's raw output, but it's, those are the, the, the output are the main variables that we get out of the climate modeling. So it could, it could be, for example, temperature, fields, humidity, precipitation. So those are really the standard output of climate models, but um, they are usually not suitable for the end users directly. Um, and those are provided at daily and monthly frequencies. So there's a gap between user needs and available data uh, on this uh, climate data infrastructure. Um, sometimes those gaps are really significant. Uh, for example, some users uh, want to assess climate change anomalies. So to do that, you need to do some average over long periods. Uh, so they need to process data to get uh, uh, those anomalies. Uh, some users want to evaluate climate extremes. So uh, more post-processing is needed to, to evaluate this from the basic variables. Um, also understanding climate change impacts, uh, it also needs specific products. Some example I can uh, uh, show is uh, some stories that uh, we can think about some uh, questions those users want to answer uh, could be like, um, will there be more droughts in Northern Spain in the future climate compared to now? Um, or it could be something like how likely landslides will occur in this uh, valley in the future? Or you could, you would want to ask maybe which region in, in Europe will see the greatest change in heat wave intensity and occurrence. So all those are the kind of questions um, the users of climate data wants to answer. And this is not really straightforward on how to use uh, available uh, variables in the, on the data nodes of the climate data infrastructure. So given this, um, it was something I had in mind for, uh, for a long time working with end users would be to provide more um, uh, end products instead of providing standard variables like temperature and precipitation, for, uh, providing more advanced products that can be used uh, to answer those questions. And uh, one of those kind of products are uh, climate indices. And so we can ask what is a climate index? So a climate index is derived from basic climate variables uh, such as temperature, humidity, precipitation, wind, or others. So those are, uh, a climate index is based on the standard output of 
uh, climate models. And um, there are many standardized uh, climate indices within the international community that has been defined. So uh, those are really uh, specific in their definition uh, so that everybody can uh, intercompare the, uh, those products together. Some example would be the warm days climate index. So this is defined as the days with the mean temperature greater than the 90th percentile of the daily mean temperature. And there are with those standardization, there's a, the name is also standardized. So we have TG90P for this one. Uh, another very simple one would be the summer days. So days with max temperature greater or equal than 25 degrees Celsius called SU. So we have all those kind of uh, climate in indices. And um, those are used to, for example, uh, to evaluate the extremes. For example, this is here a list of uh, Mediterranean summer extremes in 2021, uh, coming from the European state of the climate. And um, uh, we have seen a really uh, strong heat wave also in 2021, so not only in 2022, and affecting several regions uh, throughout Europe with droughts and heat stress and wildfires. Um, and this was even worse in 2022. So we need uh, those kind of end products to be able to assess those impacts uh, more easily. And to compute those uh, climate indices, we at Surfax uh, within the ISNES 3 H2020 projects, we have developed a tool called ICKIM. And this is a tool that is a uh, open source. Uh, with, uh, it, this is a Python software. It has a simple and flexible API. Uh, uh, but even then, with this nice tools, it's difficult for user to post process the data that is on the climate data infrastructure, uh, especially because of the large numbers of climate simulations and to be able to assess uncertainties and uh, impossibility to download all required input data. And it's very time consuming. So the idea is really to pre-generate 50 standard climate indices uh, on most of the experiments in the CMIPSIS, uh, CMIP6 uh, data sets. Uh, this is the data set that is used by most of the people right now to, uh, to assess climate impacts. Um, the idea is to uh, do that for a core set of simulations, but a large part of the total simulations. Uh, on other climate models, Every, all the greenhouse gas scenarios that are available for those climate models and all the ensemble members and versions of the data sets. And it uses daily time frequency. So the input data is quite large uh, to, to process. So there are some choices has to be made. Uh, so we, uh, we chose the reference period 1981-2010 uh, to match with the CMIP6 uh, historical period. And uh, the scenario is from 2014 to 2100. So all of this is running uh, on the INES data space. The INES data space uh, is uh, uh, provided in the context of uh, EOS. So we can see that on the right hand side, bottom right hand side. And this INES data space uh, is using uh, EGI's uh, resources. And it's caching uh, the, mo the most used data from the climate data infrastructure ESGF. And um, it provides a Jupyter Hub environment uh, that is really the interface we use to, to process data uh, in general. So this is very convenient because this is the same interface that we use for daily work, but it's, it's remote with a large uh, cache data that we can use to, um, to really fast process the data. This is an example of the screenshot of the work environment. So it's pretty standard. So it's really Jupyter Lab uh, environment uh, with a 
the notebooks, and also the terminal access for batch processing. So this is in this interface that I developed the, the script to, to, for the data, for this uh, to process the data in this use case. So the timeline is to, right now I'm validating the calculations. It's still in progress. Um, uh, this database will be stored permanently, but uh, it will probably be available in several formats. And uh, we want to make it accessible into the EasyNest3 Climate for Impact platform as well. And this database would be also used within the Horizon Europe InterTwin project for the digital twin. And uh, there will be a lot of initiative to disseminate information about this uh, database for end users. So we want to extend that into other data sets after the, afterwards. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'm uh, available for questions. Thank you very much, Christian, for your interesting presentation. Um, and for one more time, let's see if someone has a question. Um, Uh, so, from the audience, is there someone that needs to ask that would like to ask something to Christian, either here or in uh, Slido? I see something in Slido. Are there resources available that detail the requirements gathering that has led that has led to the development of these indices, climate data products? Uh... I'm not sure about the, can you repeat the first part of the question? Yes, I can we also post it here in the chat. Okay, I will open the chat yeah. because I don't, Is I there don't see, I would, uh, resources. I, would, I would exit the uh, presentation mode so I can see the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the, um, the resource, as I understand the question, is the resource available uh, uh, on the INES data space. So um, the input data uh, size is uh, several hundred of gigabytes of data because, and we are using only precipitation and temperature mostly for those climate indices. And um, the computing resources are, are much higher because uh, with percentile indices, it uh, involves a lot of uh, calculation. Um, so the, the time to process this data is over several weeks. <laughs> and uh, the amount of memory we need is at least uh, 16 gigabytes uh, to process this data, but even for the it slows down the percentage calculation. Ideally, it should be much larger, but um, in the INES data space, we have 16 gigabytes, but this is already quite good compared to what we had available uh, 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 otherwise. So I don't know if I, it answers a little bit uh, the question. Yes. Uh... I don't know the person who asked this question if if he or she was covered or not. If not, please write in the chat. Um, but thank you very much for for your answer, Christian. Um, are there any other questions for Christian? I don't see anything coming along. I think we will have some minutes in the at the end anyways, uh, because we're a bit ahead uh, in the schedule. Uh, so thank you very much for now, Christian. Um, and we can move on to the last, but uh, not least <laughs> speaker, um, who is Tjerk Kreicher uh, from Maris, uh, who will present us the, the last uh, use case on the dashboard uh, for the state of the environment. Um, very briefly to say that Herc is a project engineer, works as a project engineer at Maris 
in the Netherlands. And whenever you're ready, you can start. We already see your screen. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Gareth, for your kind introduction. Um, so I will start first with a general overview of the EOS Future project, and then we'll gradually go more into detail. So earlier, the um, European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures was established to shape the collaboration into five thematic areas, <clears throat> which you can see on screen. The environmental sciences, the social sciences, the astronomy, materials, and life sciences, um, with the idea to generate open access data for EOS. And to this end, uh, five science clusters were formed in which different research communities were brought together. Um, and these clusters include science projects uh, that were formed to show the added value of EOS, to show the supply and demand use side, so from the provider and from the um, user perspective, um, and also to induce the onboarding and integration of uh, services of EOS, which can be related to the individual research infrastructure or the uh, science project as a whole. Um, and we focus here on the NV Fair science cluster that includes two science projects, namely the uh, dashboard state of the environment and the invasive species. And here I will go into the details for the dashboard. So the current NFRI community brings together 26 European research infrastructures that are studying the different aspects of the Earth system, such as the marine, the atmosphere, the ecosystems, and solid Earth. And the research infrastructures that you see on screen are the ones that are involved in this, uh, in this dashboard. So now onto the dashboard. Um, so these research infrastructures, they provide good quality data and services to different um, communities. And in this dashboard, we process this data into uh, environmental indicators to share information on the state of the environment to users and to also increase the visibility of um, the products that are provided by these uh, scientific communities. So here we see the, the front end of the dashboard um, with environmental indicators that are produced by uh, the providers. So on the left here, for example, we see IEGOS or ICOS that both display a plugin with information about the atmospheric concentrations at different stations. So you could select here different stations to uh, generate information on the fly. And on the right, we can see the provider CDataNet, which I'm representing myself. Um, with graphs of temperature trends of different sea regions. And the idea for the dashboard is to continue growing, engaging also more providers from different communities to add their indicators to the platform. Um, so it is possible to log in uh, using the EOS AI. And if you have then sufficient rights, um, you are absolutely able to upload your indicators for the, uh, the rest to see. All right. Um, and since I'm a representative for CDataNet, I thought it would be interesting to show what's behind the, the you know, behind the figures that are displayed on this dashboard. So here we see a overview of the uh, workflow for CDataNet. And I will first go through the workflow as a whole, and then I will dive into the different components into uh, more detail. Um, so we're including seven essential ocean variables, as you see here on the left. And these are actually established variables identified by experts based on their relevance for climate research, um, the feasibility of, to actually observe them over the, uh, the global um, uh, oceans, and then their cost effectiveness. Um, so to guide you through this workflow, I will start with the example oxygen. Um, so in order to collect relevant data from the CDataNet CDI database, uh, which includes more than 2.8 million data sets, we have to transform this name Oxygen into um, something that the database actually understands or the connection with the API. Right? So this is why we have this semantic broker in place um, that takes as input the UV Oxygen and then transforms it into a list of parameter names. Uh, so these names are gathered from the NERC vocabulary service, which holds a large number of um, mostly marine vocabularies. Right, so then we have this um, list of parameter names for oxygen, and then we use it as input to the CDataNet API, in addition to the depth filter, the time period filter, and the bounding box filter. 
In this way, we can ask the CDataNet API to just give us a data file that's containing oxygen data at a specific location for a specific time period and a certain depth range. And after we have that, we apply unit conversion. So we get one uniform data set because different uh, measurements can be performed in different units. Um, and at the end, then we can use this uniform data set as input to, on the one hand, the map viewer, where we display these measurements. And on the other hand, to the Jupyter Notebook, where we um, apply algorithms to get these indicators that we show on the dashboard. So this type of workflow is also performed for Euro Argo, which has these uh, floaters all around the world. And we use that also as input to the map viewer as well as the indicators. Um, so we combine different providers um, to generate these indicators for the ocean. So now we'll go a little bit more into detail for the different components. And I'm starting with the semantic broker. So what we do here is we send this Sparkle query uh, towards the NERC vocabulary service based on the IADOC properties, such as uh, has matrix water body, has object of interest oxygen, and has property concentration. And in return, we then get a list of parameter names for CDATANET labeled as P01 and for Argo as R03, which are identifiers for a set of vocabularies in the NERC vocabulary series. Um, so if we don't have that parameter list, we can go to the CDATANET API. And what we see here is an example request where I apply the filters that I mentioned before. And if we then send this example request to the CDATANET database, uh, we require we get back one single NetCDF file, which I converted here to a data frame um, with a large number of measurements that are specific to the query that it's asked. So the CDATA Net API it does it very quick. So in five to 10 seconds, it can give you back 32, it's 32 million, yeah, 32 million uh, measurements. Um, and it's still in development, but there's already some documentation available on Swagger. Uh, but if you want more information about the functionalities of the API, you can, of course, contact me. Um, then the unit conversion that is required, since for CDATANET, uh, the different measurements are performed in different units. Um, and in this case, we have the pre preferred units on screen here. So the again, we use a smart Sparkle query, but it's too long to show on screen. But what it does, it gives us these multipliers, which you see on the, on the right uh, column to just convert from any um, unit that oxygen, for example, can be measured in towards the preferred unit. So we can use that to harmonize the, the end um, uh, net CDF or CSV, depending on what you choose to download the data. For. Right, then we can use that as input to the map viewer, um, which is actually accessible as well from the dashboard. So you just click on the CDATA net icon and you end up at the map viewer. And also for the other providers, you can click on the on the uh, icons, but it will uh, guide you to different pages. It could be the landing page of their, their portal. It could be um, what they use to provide those indicators. Uh, it kind of depends on the provider. Um, but on the map viewer, you um, you get to this screen where you can select the uh, EOVs on the left for a certain time period and depth range. So in here, we have zero to five meters. And you can zoom in, you can check out the metadata behind those uh, points uh, to get more information about those, uh, those measurements. Um, and also we use the Copernicus Marine background layer so we can compare the measurements with the satellites or model products that are behind there. And once it's also mature enough, we can uh, upload this um, map viewer to the EOS platform as well. But for now, it's still in development. Then finally to the indicators. So this, um, we focus more on the European landscape because there's more um, data available for us there. Um, so we divide it into five different sea regions. And as I said before, we have for the API, we selected bounding box, but of course a bounding box doesn't, doesn't give you this select um, shape here. So what we do, we pre, pre ask, let's say a bounding box this size, and then we uh, cut out the polygon uh, to get just the Western Mediterranean region. 
Um, so as an example here, I select measurements for the Western Mediterranean from the period 1980 till now for the top 10 meters of the ocean. And you can see all the measurements here in this figure. And from these measurements, we can then calculate the annual temperature mean or seasonal temperature mean uh, with their respective standard deviations. And the bars behind there are the amount of observations. Uh, so you can see that over the years, the amount of person, uh, observations increased. What you can also see is that in the last decade or two, you see clearly a trend of the annual temperature mean and the surface layers of the Western Mediterranean rising. Um, so yeah, this was all from my side for now. We would like to, of course, also show you that for oxygen and the other parameters, but uh, we're still working to get more uh, data from there. So we um, don't have a lot of um, um, yeah, lack of res uh, data in between the, the time uh, series. Mm -hmm. So that was it. Thanks for your attention. And please, if you want to get in contact, you can use my email on the screen. All right. Thank you very much, Tjerk, uh, for the presentation. Um, I see two questions, one in Slido and one in the chat. So let's start from Slido. As far as I know, my binder only provides a very small amount of resources. What if a Jupyter Notebooks needs more CPUs and RAM to run? I will also paste it in the chat in case you need to reread it. What is my binder? Um, was it to the previous? Was it actually? Uh, was it mentioned by Anne or Federica? Yeah, I'm not quite not sure. Not by me. I don't know what my binder. By you. Okay, but yeah. I see a question uh, right above. Tut Herk, that's clear. It's for you. <laughs> uh, PIs provide more detail around. Please, I guess. Please provide more detail around five thematic services as you mentioned. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, going back to my screen. Right, going to the start because I mentioned it all the way in the beginning. Right, so we have um, EOS Future Work Pack 6 where we have five different um, science clusters. And um, these are basically um, each of these science clusters is related to one of these environmental sciences, right? So we have ESCAPE, which is about astronomy. And for example, they have a, a science project involved with dark matter. So um, it's just going to EOS from different points of views, different uh, scientific communities, and try to use the resources that they can provide, uh, access open data and uh, provide open data. So we are in the environmental sciences. So we're looking for atmosphere, for biodiversity, from the ocean perspective, but um, astronomy is looking, for example, from the dark matter perspective. Then we have the COVID-19 that's looking from the health perspective. So just to have a more complete picture of different uh, scientific domains to um, integrate with EOS. So I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you very much. In any case, uh, Federica and Anne, are you still around? Ah, yes, hello. I answered the question. Okay. I think. Ah, you just paste uh, answered it in the in the chat, right? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I I, sh I didn't know. I, I should I answer them? In... No, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's okay. great. Uh, I was just not sure myself who mentioned it. Uh, it was you, Federica. I think we both mentioned it. Ah, you both mentioned it. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we have a few minutes uh, for questions for anyone, uh, Tjerk or any previous speaker. Um, so if someone has an additional question, now it's the time. Otherwise, I guess we will just close uh, this session a bit earlier. Uh, Sara, I don't know if you're around. I am, and I think it's okay. I mean, yeah. also closing the sessions before. Okay, uh, I see another question. 
from Dale on Sligo. I'm curious if anyone can share experiences of integrating services in EOSC. Is there someone from the speakers that could answer this question? So I can answer from my point of view. So um, from the, well, there are multiple layers in the sense, like for the dashboard, we're involved from different provi provider point of view. We provide, um, provide indicators to the dashboard. And then the dashboard as a whole is being onboarded into um, EOS, so other people can uh, access the resource. But then from, for example, CDataNet as provider, we also have our own resources. And due to this EOS Future project, um, we started to uh, look into different integrations possibilities for, for example, the CDataNet CDI, but also to onboard service that we have. And um, as I said, you showed you before, the map viewer that will also be onboarded to EOS. And for the Jupyter Notebook that we have, where we uh, generate these indicators, uh, we will use in the future when we have more data and from different providers as well, um, EOS computes, so the EGIs or other resources that we can find to generate these, uh, uh, these indicators. So there's multiple layers from, uh, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And um, Federica and Anne from Reliance, do you have any experiences to share on this, uh, maybe? I mean, I'm not in the technical team, so I'm not onboarding services, but uh, from a user point of view, in the Reliance, we are uh, using a bundle of EO services. And uh, they use the uh, uh, EOS interoperability framework, I think, to uh, interoperate from uh, each other. And this is what is done in the framework of the EOS Future project, if uh, my understanding is correct. I don't know, Elisa or Federica, if you want to add something. Yes, we are the three communities demonstrating the services. So we are not the technical part, but we have several partners that did this kind of job in the project. Absolutely. So we are not the right people to answer to answer this question. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Dale. Uh, I think refers now to Thierk about the experiences that you mentioned already, and he says, uh, "Oh, there, there are certainly bumps in the road, I guess. But um, so it's not easy from the start. But um, getting feedback from us because we say this onboarding process is maybe a bit difficult uh, helps shape." Uh, the next months or the, the changes that uh, will be made, maybe. Um, but also, for example, the AI was also a feature that we integrated with EOS. Uh, I'm not into the specifics there. Um, but yeah, certainly it was not smooth, but also not the, 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 the worst experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Raul, you want to state something yourself? Yes, yes, hi. Uh, so because they are asking uh, here in the audience, people is a bit uh, yeah, curious about the experiences of integrating the services, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I can say a little bit on, on that, of course, because we are from uh, the technical part, of course, of Reliance. So uh, we were using several services. Uh, the experience was uh, uh, something like the previous speaker said. So it was not like... Um, the most smooth one because many of them were still being, you know, integrated on border into EOS. So it was in the early phases of this integration and onboarding. So it took us a little bit of time, uh, but uh, it wasn't also bad because we had a good communication with the, the technical providers of, of the different services. So uh, it was always a very um, good uh, um, interaction with the people. I think the best way also for for people to to have you know resolve questions and and issues is also via the help desk of uh, uh, for example the EGI help desk or in the case of services related to EGI we we solved several issues in that way uh, so the the support it was let's say good the the process was not very smooth from the beginning because it was still being defined but the support was good basically that's the, the idea there. And that's very important. Yeah. 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 Uh, Raul, thank you for this. Uh, Francis says, could you describe the ESC services you used? 
Yeah, yeah. So in, in our case, we, we were using uh, from EGI, for example, we used uh, EGI notebooks, EGI binder, EGI check-in, of course, uh, from DICE. I mean, uh, EUDAT, basically, we are using this B2Drop and, and, and B2Share. And from OpenAir, we are using Zenodo and the research graph of OpenAir. So we are integrating, for example, the research objects from Rohab into, into the research graph. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we, we are using this um, uh, EGI Data Hub as well. That's another from EGI that we are using. So yeah, we are using many, many services of, uh, uh, of different providers. So it, it took, uh, like I said, a good support. And the, the, the process wasn't that uh, very smooth to find, but it, the support was generally good in, in all the cases. So that was the important thing. Thank you. And I think we saw very clearly in the demos of uh, Anne and Federica earlier how all of these services are combined in the workflows. Um, to Christian, uh, I don't know if Christian, you're still around. Yes, you are. Yes, you mentioned your work will be taken forward via digital twins. Can you provide some more details on this? Uh, yes, because uh, the, the the goal in the uh, intertwin in that case is to uh, develop a methodology based on uh, AI techniques to um, assess the change of characteristics of climatic streams in the future climate. So to do it very fast using uh, AI techniques, we need uh, this database uh, to be able to characterize the future climatic streams. So this is how it will be used. And this is why I mentioned briefly that uh, it would be stored in uh, different file formats. Uh, for this specific use, it will pro be probably in ZAR format, but uh, that is not uh, uh, that, that is not uh, really established yet. So we we didn't decide uh, fully yet. But uh, this is how it will be uh, used uh, for the digital twin. Mm -hmm. And this is, I guess, work that will continue in the intertwin project that you mentioned earlier. Yes, 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 yes. So it it helps as a bridge between the ISNS three project and the two EOSC and EGIAs, and then into uh, intertwin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, last question, although we are over time, but I think it's it's it is an important question uh, to Raúl. Uh, will the ESC services you used and developed remain operational after the end of the respective projects which set them up? I think this is a, a important question for all our projects. Exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, this is part of the sustainability of the services that we are uh, defining and, and, and finding the mechanisms to, to make them available, but it applies for all the infra uh, 07 projects like uh, Caris is also one of the coordinators she knows all of this process as well that we are working on so the idea is to continue providing virtual access VA to to our services beyond the project lifetime right that's that's the idea and the exact way should uh, still be defined but uh, our intention is definitely to keep those services alive exactly uh, so I think we can wrap up now. Um, thank you very much to the speakers uh, for your very interesting presentations and demos. And thank you very much to the audience for engaging with your questions. Um, now we have a break of 15 minutes and what follows after the break started starting at 11.15 is the next session on uh, the good health and well-being shared by John Favaro. So enjoy your break and see, see you in 15 minutes. So hello and welcome to the session on digital assets supporting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number three on good health and well-being. My name is John Favaro and I'm the communications uh, lead for the DICE project. So um, can we go to the next slide? Great. So uh, first, of, a couple of uh, housekeeping rules uh, for those of you who just arrived now uh, for this session. 
we are uh, recording the event in its entirety. Uh, and there will be a link to all of the recordings uh, afterwards. Uh, please don't activate your microphone during the uh, during the talks. People can hear them <laughs> and uh, videos unless the, the host gives you permission, please. And remember, there is a Slido going on right now where you can answer questions at any time during the uh, during the talks, uh, that, which will either be answered immediately or during a question and answer session uh, afterwards. So please. Be active and ask, ask a lot of questions. Uh, we've, we've been enjoying them so far. Okay, so next slide. Well, okay, so, um, well, the, the, the spectacular success of the effort to develop the COVID-19 vaccine in record time was really only the most highly publicized showcasing of the enormous advances in international uh, collaboration uh, in the areas of health, nutrition, and the life sciences in general. And at the heart of these successes are the powerful digital platforms and infrastructures that were talked about in the keynote uh, earlier today that permit this collaboration among researchers. So in this session, we are going to present to you three of our EOSC infrastructure assets that are providing this kind of digital support to our researchers in structural biology, life sciences, and let's say bioinformatics in general. And that brings me to our first speaker, uh, who is Bjorn Gröning of EGI ACE. Bjorn works at the University of Freiburg, uh, where he's leading the Galaxy.eu team that is focusing in particular on bioinformatics. So Bjorn, the, the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead and share your slides. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Um, can you see the slides? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I was invited to talk a little bit about the European Galaxy server or the Galaxy project and how it influences um, yeah, well-being, public health and our ecosystem or um, in, in general, I guess. Um, and I would spend the first few slides to introduce what this Galaxy framework or platform is. Um, and in particular, I mean, there's one bigger Galaxy server running. That's a European Galaxy server with more than 50,000 users. But Galaxy is a framework. Everyone can deploy it. So we have many national instances, the Spanish one, the Belgian one, the Norwegian one. Um, and they are institutional instances um, that you can run for your lab, for your university, and so on. So we know of more than 200 um, more or less public Galaxy instances, and we estimate uh, more than 1,000 actually um, yeah, more private instances available. But what is the European Galaxy server in particular? Um, it's, it's an infrastructure. Uh, so it's an infrastructure as code. So it's a, it's a server client model that can schedule tools, workflows, um, notebooks, interactive environments, as you will see um, soon. But the European one, and especially with the help of Elixir, EGI, and EOS, has, has access to resources across Europe. So we can schedule notebooks and, um, and jobs across many different HPC and cloud um, resources that we have available in Europe. Um, Galaxy on its own is, is really just a framework where you plug in your tools and then these tools can be assembled to workflows. So classical workflows where you have an input, you have a bunch of computing steps, and in the end you have one or multiple outputs um, can be put together in Galaxy via a graphical user interface or be a kind of a textual representation of that workflow. And then you can run this um, workflow in a completely reproduced way. This runs in containers and con environments as you like. So this is configurable by an administrator and it's highly flexible. So we can run more or less every tool that is automatizable uh, with this framework. You, you, we just need to integrate it. Um, we need to describe the inputs and outputs and the parameters. And then Galaxy will give you a graphical user interface um, which you, where you can configure the parameters. These tools can not only be static tools like some Python scripts, some Perl scripts, or some C or Fortran code. 
those tools can also be interactive tools. And this is what we call them, interactive tools. And this can be a Jupyter notebook, our studio instances, um, fancy visualizations and on its own needs a server backend model. And this can be all integrated in Galaxy. So essentially you can think about Galaxy of an integrative platform where you can bring together your notebooks, your classical HPC tools and work with them together. So the Jupyter notebook that you start in Galaxy has access to all the data that is in your user account and that you can access. All these assets, and N has a nice presentation um, previously about sharing research objects. Um, it's the same concept here. You have these, these um, research objects that we call a history. You can share that with other users. You can share workflows, um, modify them, fork them. Um, and this all in combination with classical HPC workflows and Jupyter Notebooks are still use. There's a bunch of more interactive environments, um, as I said, from visualizations, um, but you can also have your ESA calc application um, in Galaxy to have fancy um, yeah, spreadsheet functionalities. But um, of course, the, the main usage that we see is, is uh, with Jupyter Notebooks, our studio instances, and these kind of things. Um, Galaxy is used across a broad um, domain of scientific use cases. So especially in Elixir, we, we have um, yeah, a lot of users from different domains, so um, different life science domains. Um, but there's also this climate.usegalaxy.eu spearheaded by, by Anne um, and, and many other things that go now way beyond life science. Um, so for chemists, um, for material science, um, yeah, that are picking up and, and taking um, the advantages of this framework. <clears throat> and in the next slides, I would like to introduce you to a few projects that we have done on this framework or that the community has done with this framework. And this is just one slide that I have from Anne. So this is kind of the, the climate community. And you can see here how kind of how the Galaxy framework with these workflows and with the history model can actually interact very nicely with the Jupyter Notebook and, and Pangeo in, in particular, um, and bridging more or less both worlds. Uh, you, you can um, model use cases like um, person in the middle or person in the loop, where you have the classical HPC workflows. In the middle, a notebook starts. You need to do some interactive um, yeah, action inside the notebook. You close the notebook and the um, workflow continues. So this is now all possible um, with this framework. Um, and Copernicus integration is also included. Um, so you can get your data into the framework, execute your jobs, notebooks, save your notebooks, share that um, notebook again. And if you like, export your scientific results um, yeah, later on to some permanent archive. Another project that I would like to talk about is this vertebrate genome project. So that's a kind of a biodiversity project. It's, it's actually a worldwide project where the scientific community tries to assemble, so tries to sequence the genomes of all vertebrates um, on our planet. So it's a worldwide project, also with a collaboration with Africa, Australia, and so on, um, Yeah, to sequence all animals. Um, and this is a computational, very extensive task, as you can imagine. Um, but the workflows and the tools that, that are needed are all integrated in Galaxy, and you can now run um, all these assembly steps in, in Galaxy, for example. Now coming a little bit more to the topic of the session. Um, so, um, yeah, health and well-being. So with the start of the pandemic, um, and with the appearance of the first public data sets, we have actually sit together and we were able to spin up the first workflows in one week in Galaxy and all different kinds of workflows. So at first, so in the first weeks or two weeks when we had public data set, the actual question was, how can we assemble um, SARS-CoV-2? So how can we assemble the virus genome? Uh, so we had then specific um, workflows um, for this virus. 
But later on, we shifted um, the focus, um, for example, then to variation analysis. So which strains of the virus appear at which time? How does a virus mutate? And all these different questions we could actually, um, yeah, um, run in Galaxy. We could provide these workflows and offer that to the community. And everyone that were able actually or wanted to share data um, yeah, could do that. And we know from instances in Estonia, in the US, um, where they were running these workflows to analyze actually data on a national scale. Um, there are a bunch of more workflows. And if you're interested more, we, we have run webinar series about this work later on. <clears throat> There's also a lot of training material available um, to understand how you can analyze, um, yeah, infectious diseases in that sense. Um, later on, a few months um, in the pandemic, we moved to an automatic analysis procedure. So essentially we used Galaxy then um, via programmatically accessed. So you can also um, run workflows and tools via the command line. So we created actually a bot that is tracking public data repositories. And as soon as a new data set comes out, we were actually triggering the workflows. We were analyzing the data completely automatic and we were exporting the results to public archives um, like um, our friends in Barcelona provided us the viral beacon and, and the data storage there. But we also um, populated um, notebooks and interactive notebooks automatically with these um, um, bot analyzed data sets and made them um, available. And this increased the turnaround dramatically, right? So as soon as there is a public data set, um, a few days later, we had them actually analyzed and pushed them to public archives. And the interesting story here is after three years in the pandemic, this system is now still working. It's still analyzing and crunching data. And we can, and we could show um, that this is, can be easily transferred to other infectious diseases, right? even beyond, um, human infections, if you if you think about cattle and, and, um, and the swine flu, um, we could show that with slight modifications in our workflows um, that need to adjust to the organism, we can actually use the same procedure with the same bots um, to actually study other infectious diseases. Um, another use case I would like to show here is, um, and this goes in, in the region of cancer research, so human cancer research, that's a use case where you actually combine um, MALDI data, so MS data, with imaging data. Now it's called MALDI imaging, so you have a tumor sample, you have slices of a tumor sample, um, and now you have an image of the slice, and for every pixel in this image, you have an entire proteomics or metabolomic spectrum. And you can now compare these different pixels, these different proteome spectras, and can, for example, say that this region of your image is or seems to be a tumor, and the region next to it is not a tumor. So that you can actually find the, the borders of your tumor, um, of, of your yeah, tumor tissue, um, very detailed in your samples. Yeah, and um, this is a lot of data um, that is actually um, acquisitioned here. And yeah, also for that, um, our community um, and or the pathology community in that case has actually developed um, a, quite, a, 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 a quite powerful workflow to analyze those um, tumor samples. Um, this is more the the classical variant analysis of tumors. This is of course also possible. I just included here um, a tool from our Norwegian friends um, that is um, giving you a summary of, um, um, yeah, of different um, variants and different SNPs that they found between tumor samples. The, the key message here is just, if you want to do tumor data analysis, um, that's also possible. And there are a lot of people um, that developing already workflows. So there's a good chance that you can actually just use it right away. Um, which brings me to the next slide of um, that biological data is, is complicated, right? And I think 
the current state of machine learning is actually quite um, good and, and quite applicable to those use cases. What we are maybe missing is a good annotated data sets, right? So, um, but we are getting there. For the time being, and I think we can also play around with that and we can work in this direction, um, we have this entire set of a machine learning tool suite in Galaxy. Yeah, we have the basic the basic set of scikit-learn um, um, in, in Galaxy. Um, we can run tools like AlphaFold on GPUs um, and, and scale them um, yeah, to many thousand um, of runs. Um, yeah. We, we have graphical representations, um, tools that try to visualize your network um, that you have constructed. But please check out the publication if you are more interested in that or, or ask any questions later on. Um, one of my last slides is just a, a hint to the training material. So, as I said, this is a very, I mean, Galaxy on its own is a framework, right? It's, it's not particular to one scientific domain. So all scientific do, domains can use it if they want. Um, but that also means a kind of a challenge for the um, for the training and for the outreach. So what we have is, as part of the Galaxy project, we have a training network initiative where all these different scientific communities can contribute training material um, written in a markdown file um, to this network. And we will render them automatically. We provide the infrastructure. We have bots that create automatically videos for you um that will read your slides um they are accessible um we provide um yeah sub um, headings and so on so that you can make use of that um and we have more than 300 different um tutorials in this training network so if you want to start with climate data analysis and you have never done it just check out the climate um, um training material here if you want to learn R or Python, just check out our training material. Um, yeah, self-study courses, um, how to use R and Python, how to combine that with Galaxy workflows, how to analyze two more samples or all different kinds of um, data analysis that you want to learn. Because we provide also um, the data sets for you. Right, so tiny, small data set that you can actually train yourself in a few hours and don't need to wait for a few days until your data sets are analyzed. But we will provide also the infrastructure um, to run those trainings for you. Yeah, and I think that's it. Um, thanks for all people that made that possible, um, especially um, EGI, um, Elixir, and um, yeah, the EOSC. Um, in general that that made that happen and which we rely on for infrastructure and um, community support thanks a lot thanks very much Bjorn for a very interesting talk uh, we do have a couple of questions uh sure. you, you mentioned quite a bit about the uh the the COVID uh, research being done and how quickly it was done and in a collaborative way and uh um and so did I. I mentioned the, the vaccine development as being one of the, the highlighted successes, but it was pointed out in a question that the, the people who actually developed the vaccine, the BioNTech people, probably didn't use Galaxy. And this points to a, a larger question of whether it is difficult in, in this particular domain to get to certain communities like this kind of commercial community where uh, farm, uh, pharmaceuticals are being developed and people may hesitate to use something like Galaxy or an open thing. There may be propriety issues or things like that. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, many comments. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a large field. I mean, we, we know that the big pharma companies are using Galaxy in-house. Um, but they all, I mean, the, the context that we had to, with them they always break down at the point where they wanted to have a contract with us right and we cannot we cannot sign any contracts at least not as a university we cannot give any guarantees i mean we are an open source project i don't think that's a big problem um i, th I mean in general it would be easier if we could actually work with them more closely together um, but that's how it is 
from what I know, they struggle more internally in general with all different kinds of open source software, right? Um, especially if you have complex workflows that are consisting of, let's say, 100 different steps, you potentially have a mixture of 100 different licenses, right? And this is always a struggle for them. So what we are doing in, in different communities, so in, in Galaxy, in Bioconda, in, in BioTools, Open eBench will be talked about later. Um, what we are trying here is to really annotate all pieces of our, let's say, ecosystem with a license, okay? That's, that's not even the standard now. But if we have that, and if we can provide the commercial entities with an easy way to access at least all licenses, that you need to have or that you need to accept when you run such a workflow, I think that brings them a huge step um, forward. Yeah, and this is where we can help them. Oh, but they have all, all yes. different kinds of other problems. Um, but yeah, maybe we don't go into this. this <laughs> okay, I'm sure that's true. There is one more comment. It's a comment uh, that you might want to respond to in any case. Uh, and saying that HPC versus Galaxy is very limited and far from being exascale. I can't really respond to that. I can't really interpret that more uh, more closely, but do you have a comment on that? I'm not sure what that means, but yes. um, so Galaxy is nothing more than it's it's creating jobs and set and set the um, and send that to an HPC or whatever resources you have, right? In the end. Galaxy submits jobs to HD Condor or Slurm. Um, so if that does a human or if that is automatically done by Galaxy, I don't think is a problem. So um, Galaxy can schedule jobs um, across different domains, across different clouds. I think the European Galaxy server schedules now three or four million jobs a month. Um, yeah, um, from... Let me, I think from 3,000 active users a month, um, I think that demonstrates quite a bit the scalability, but I'm happy to chat about that later. because I Certainly, don't and that uh, really uh, the person who asked that question, of course, welcome to elaborate it on for, uh, for further discussion later on. So thank you once again, uh, Bjorn. This sure. was a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, and so now I'd like to turn to the next uh, speaker, who is going to be uh, Antonio Rosato. Uh, who is also from our uh, 07 EGIA's project. Antonio is currently an associate professor at the University of Florence, and he's going to present to us the worldwide e-infrastructure for nuclear magnetic resonance and structural biology. So the floor is yours, uh, Antonio. I hope you can share your slides. Okay. Uh, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Uh, can you see the slides and yes, hear me? Yes, all clear. Beautiful. So... Uh, our domain is uh, more narrow focus than Galaxy and uh, is, uh, as you mentioned in your kind introduction, uh, uh, we focus on structural biology. So essentially we try to uh, unravel the three-dimensional structures of biological macromolecules, uh, proteins and nucleic acids, uh, how they interact with each other uh, where drugs bind in the uh, binding pockets of receptors, that, that kind of applications. So as you see the, there in the bottom uh, right corner, <clears throat> our main use cases is looking at what uh, is the structural role of mutations that are linked to disease, uh, and of course uh, provide uh, drug design, which um, Sorry, a framework for, for drug design, which of course is central to the topic of today. Um, this is our old uh, website, which uh, we set up uh, under one of the EOSC uh, predecessors projects. Uh, uh, so uh, before uh, EGIAs uh, started uh, its legacy. So now all the services are all available from the uh, marketplace of the EOSC. Uh, we Still keep the old website as a as a pointer, uh, but as I mentioned, now that the real place uh, to go to, if you don't, uh, uh, unless you of course have the direct link from one of our publications, 
the go-to place to find out about what our services is the marketplace of the EOS portal where we are registered as a uh, as one of the many providers who are there, also in collaboration with the Instruct uh, research infrastructure. And that's a partial list that you get if you, if you look for our services, and I'll mention a couple of these services more in detail in a uh, couple of minutes. Uh, so before we go into the, the detail of what the services are and what they do, uh, I have a couple of slides, let's say, to recap our history, uh, since we have a long, uh, um, a long collaboration with uh, with EGI under various forms. Uh, we started providing services uh, <clears throat> on the grid uh, um, slightly more than ten years ago, actually, with a project which is not even on the slide. It was called ENMR. And then we had uh, multiple projects uh, always interacting with each EGI. Uh, that has always uh, been our underlying computational infrastructure. So we don't use HPC very much. Our typical applications are more focused on running tens to hundreds uh, or thousands of smaller jobs. So for example, think screening uh, a library, you have uh, many different ligands, you can just run them in parallel. Or if you're looking at uh, determining the three-dimensional structure of the protein, and that was uh, uh, before uh, AlphaFold 2 came into action, you would actually try several tens of different conformations and see which conformation would agree uh, a better with your uh, experimental NMR data. So basically all of our main uh, application scenarios uh, were especially suited for running in uh, parallel on a high throughput uh, computational infrastructure rather than making use of HPC with some exceptions, of course, but the bulk of it. Uh, so we have been interacting with G EGIA's uh, project uh, more recently, as John uh, mentioned as well. And uh, uh, I have this couple of slides about EGIA's, which I'm really not in the position to comment uh, very much since we are only a small part of the project. Uh, I would just like to point out that not only the project covers uh, all of Europe, but uh, there are also very strong ties uh, uh, across the ocean. And we've been uh, working a lot, for example, with the uh, grid efforts in the United States to allow our uh, American uh, fellow scientists to be able to run our own tools uh, using their own uh, grid infrastructure so that data didn't have to go uh, back and forth uh, across the ocean. And similar initiatives have been uh, uh, going on with uh, the um, uh, Asia, with various Asian grid initiatives, and uh, <clears throat> they're all been working very well. So this this idea of of connecting to the regional grid infrastructures, leveraging the um, connections and the tools provided by EGI and EGIAs more recently have been uh, uh, instrumental, I would say. And uh, one of the key aspects, of course, was uh, obtaining uh, enough uh, uh, CPU time. And uh, we did this by a series of multiple service, leg le sorry, service level agreements that we renewed over the years and across the various projects that I mentioned. And uh, uh, as you as you see from the numbers of the slide on the slide, there's uh, plenty full for uh, uh, our level of uh, of consumption. Now this is an older slide from one of the previous projects. You see our services fit into the life sciences context, and we don't go from uh, docking of uh, molecules to one another, so the simulation of how different molecules interact with each other, to structure determination, uh, uh, prediction of molecular dynamics, and uh, other more, uh, uh, let's say, niche uh, products that, that we have. 
So I would like just to comment on a couple of those uh, in the time, in the remaining time. Uh, this uh, portal, which we run in Florence, is uh, <coughs> used to uh, refine uh, protein structures or uh, any macromolecular structure for that matter that is being uh, determined uh, in order to optimize its agreement with uh, uh, NMR data. And uh, uh, this is a system where we pioneered the use of GPUs uh, in EGI. I think we were actually the first ones both to provide GPUs and to provide uh, a, a mechanism, a middleware, to be able to link the portal to GPUs. So nowadays, it's, of course, a common resource. Uh, but at the time, it was a relatively novel usage in the context of the grid. And it was done before, uh, of course, calculations with GPUs are, are much faster. Our flagship uh, implementation is the Haddock software, which is provided by the uh, Dutch colleagues in the WNMR network. And it's used to um, be able to uh, determine the structure of macromolecular attacks when you have multiple molecules interacting with uh, each other based on data, uh, which can be experimental uh, or computer generated or a mixture of the two. Here you see a map of all the users of uh, registered with the WNMR digital organization. Uh, as you can see, they are spread uh, worldwide uh, with a few hotspots of usage. And if you look at the numbers in the table below, you see that Haddock is, of course, as I said, the flagship. So it's uh, contributing uh, like 80% or so of the users. And uh, uh, But with the other applications, we do cover niches that uh, uh, otherwise wouldn't be able to use uh, um, advanced computational services in a seamless manner. Uh, this is the resource usage, which I'm just showing to show uh, the increases that we have experienced uh, since the pandemics, because of course people uh, were at home, they couldn't access their wet labs, and uh, apparently this motivated them to make a larger use of uh, uh, computational and simulation resources. So you see that in 2020, 2020 until uh, 2022, the average uh, level of usage is significantly higher than what uh, we had seen until 2019. And that was, of course, related to COVID. And we measured uh, actually the impact of COVID by asking users to tag their jobs if they were COVID related. And uh, as you can see, uh, there was a significant uh, interest, uh, uh, particularly for the aspect, of course, of uh, docking uh, small molecules <coughs> into candidate uh, uh, viral uh, drug receptors. Uh, we do have other measures of uh, measuring uh, impact, and uh, we have uh, citations uh, that, as you can see, we start back uh, from 2004, because some of the underlying services were existing before the, the project started. And we've been growing steadily. You can see the number of citations per year or the aggregated number on, on the right panel. So the, the growth uh, is, uh, is relatively steady. And that's uh, that's a few uh, main points. So we have... Uh, 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 history longer than 10 years of providing services in the field of structural biology using uh, the grid infrastructure. Uh, we have transitioned uh, successfully to link to the EOSC initiatives, uh, having, uh, thanks to this transition, uh, better access to computational resources and uh, better uh, sustainability uh, in the medium uh, to long term, I would say. And I just like to acknowledge all the people. You see the WNMR team, the, the core PIs, uh, besides myself, where Alexander Bonveni in Utrecht and Marco Verlato at the National Institute of Physics in Padua, and some uh, of our founders are on the slide.
and thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much, Antonio, for this talk. Uh, you you touched on ver some very very important topics. Uh, I would like to to bring up a topic that was brought up earlier because uh, it sort of jumped out at me uh, uh, when you uh, when you mentioned it, and it was simply you said that you had a let's say an agreement with EGIAs until June of twenty three for their resources. Now, have you begun talks about what happens afterwards, uh, about, the let's say, the sustainability of the resources you have from them? Uh, yes, we, yes, we have. Uh, we still don't have a formalized uh, agreement yet. Uh, we also take advantage of the national grid initiatives. I didn't touch on this point, but a lot of interactions have happened also through the, the national nodes of the European grid. I don't know exactly what's the, the correct formulation. So uh, let's say we, we do have backup plans uh, in, uh, also to, to use uh, more of the national computing power, uh, which is uh, still available to non-national users. Uh, but given previous history, I'm quite confident that we will be able to, to use uh, the European grid services also in the next few years so there are many paths to sustainability what you're saying uh, absolutely yes and we we like to to have multiple uh, 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 opportunities uh, uh, available Let's yes say. thank you all right thank you very much Antonio. that was very very interesting so now i'd like to uh, move on to our, our last but not least speaker uh, uh, our, our final speaker is uh, Salvador Capella, who is with my partner in, uh, in the DICE project, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, where he works in the Spanish National Bioinformatics Coordination Node. And uh, his, his co-author is uh, Josep Luis Gelpi, who is, with us, uh, who is with us today and is the director of the Computational Bioinformatics Node of the Spanish National Institute. In any case, uh, Salvador is going to present uh, another EOSC resource uh, called uh, Open eBench uh, for supporting community-driven scientific benchmarks for life sciences. And I see you're ready to go, Salvador. So the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm happy to, to be here and then to introduce a little bit the work that we have been doing in Open eBench for the last five years. When we think about benchmarking, many people have different concepts of benchmarking, what it's about. Uh, I will say benchmarking can um, be considered in three main areas. The scientific benchmarking, meaning what are the results that interest to us as a researcher. The technical benchmarking that has to do with how good is the software or how much resources we need to, to for the software to run, memory, storage, CPUs, and so on and so forth. And then we can also consider benchmarking from the perspective of functional uh, benchmarking, uh, meaning how easy it is to use software, uh, how good is the documentation, and so on and so forth. You might have a really nice software, but if you don't have documentation, it might be very difficult uh, to use. So in open events, we have been uh, supporting communities around the scientific benchmarking, but also a little bit in technical benchmarking. So we have... Um, we have a platform, uh, you can visit the, the website where you will see that we have two components. We have scientific benchmarking as such, where we support communities, and then we have what we call tools observatory. And I would like to introduce a little bit the tools observatory because in life sciences, what we're doing is just to um, consider monitoring how much so how software is being developed. So we are collecting for 43,000 different entries um, in, in life sciences specifically, uh, individual metrics for each of the software. We do them uh, daily, weekly, monthly, or, or yearly, and then allow us to elaborate a little bit uh, general trends. And as Björn was mentioning earlier, uh, the licensing is a very important aspect. Why? Because we are seeing that more or roughly half of the software in life sciences have no license. So it's very difficult for any uh, company, and actually it should be very difficult to any one of us to use software that is not licensed because we don't know what are the conditions of use that software. So we're monitoring that. We are also monitoring versioning. That is another important aspect because when you are benchmarking software, you want to understand which version you are looking at. And those are two particular examples that we have been working for the last uh, two years where we have been computing 
what we call the uh, fair for research software. So we have a number of, um, and it's a community effort, right? So we have a number of um, uh, principles that has been translated into uh, metrics and so on. And we have to be looking at them across uh, this, uh, for this for, uh, 43,000 uh, software entries. And then we have the results here. So what we can say is findability is essential. If you cannot find software, then you cannot measure any signals. The more difficult one is the interoperability the, in the sense of having a good principle representing interoperability is tricky and then measure them automatically is also tricky. As a community effort, we're working towards constantly improve these aspects and uh, how to make it uh, automatic. That is, uh, let's say, one, um, one um, uh, um, kind of uh, screenshot of the situation, but we expect to do this uh, periodically. And of course, when you have all the software, you can start doing many analysis, for instance, how software is being uh, used in, in workflows and whether the community is properly documenting that is just an, a, 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 an example of the metadata that we have that allow us to make all these analysis. Going back to the scientific benchmarking part, that I think is quite relevant. So benchmarking in life sciences, everyone agrees that it's nice, but sometimes it's difficult to do, and especially it's difficult to maintain it over time. So uh, open events try to support the communities, providing a platform where they can uh, pro, uh, bring that information, they can keep it, and they can use it in the long term. So when we're talking about scientific benchmarking, we're talking about supporting communities in three main aspects. First, to identify what are the data sets. Data sets represent the challenges they have at hand, and eventually those challenges will evolve in time. The, to represent and to capture the evaluation metrics, so how you evaluate the performance of, um, of in your community. So because when we're talking technical ones, it's easy. CPU, RAM, um, uh, number of processor, whether you're multiprocessor or not. But when you're talking about a particular community, scientific domain, so they have very particular uh, measure. Maybe precision, maybe accuracy, maybe something else. And actually, we're not just interested in the evaluation metrics, but we're also interested to how to represent those results and how to contribute or to help everyone from the community and beyond the community to interpret the results. Actually, the way we engage with the community is through three different levels. Level one is quite easy. So basically, you have run all the benchmarking activities and you just need a platform to visualize data to keep it long term. Level two is when we start working closely with community because that means that still the predictions are done somewhere else, but the evaluation is happening in, in, in open events. And level three is when rather than uh, being the predictions, the results being computed somewhere else, those are computed in, in open events. That means that you need to either to submit your workflow or you need to submit your software package, along with the best standards and um, best practices in the community that we can evaluate that. Level one and two are fully production. Level three, we just have uh, prototypes because we need to understand very well what are the expectations of the community, what is the level of, um, or what are the, the requirements that we need to, to run those uh, workflows or the software. And actually, depending on that, we might reach to projects like EIAs, I know it's finishing, but or similar to look for those computational resources. The important aspect here is we should be executing them in the same place so we can all, always have the technical and the scientific performance. So if we translate this a little bit into what is behind the scenes, so we have level one on the right, so you can see the, the visualization that they help users to interpret the results. Then we go to level two, then we're, we're, it's when we start talking about workflows to facilitate the evaluation, when we start talking about JSON that comes and go and so on and so forth, where we model the data per se, and when we're talking level three, is like, well, we define the workflows or the containerized software, we use Galaxy, NetFlow, CWL, a number of um, uh, community-led uh, resources to facilitate the, 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 the management of those, and of course, we need to consider the input files. So here is a little bit what we offer the community after the execution and the visualization of data. You will see a number of participants that are grouped that we, group, we cluster them through uh, four different categories to help people to understand what is the performance of tools and so on and so forth. Because there is a particular category, but usually the community is organized efforts across a number of categories. So you might be interested to find which one is the best, maybe this one, or which one is systematically 
among the best when you're looking at across different categories. So when we look at the, at the uh, open events, we have a number of communities. So here we have just eight of them. So there is kind of a, a north capture, uh, but we are working with many in the in the background. So when they are happy to go, then we publish the results and so on and so forth. And we have uh, published in the in meanwhile is what we call the project spaces, where we have a way to represent much more information for a given uh, project, so where we can elaborate a little bit further, have custom visualizations, and so on and so forth. So I'm um, coming back to EOS and, and the different interactions and so on and so forth. One really uh, important aspect to us, and this was done in the context of EOS Synergy, is like how to facilitate the data that we have been organizing, that we have been standardized to make it long-term, to have a DOI that people can use, can cite, and so on. So recognize the, the attribution and the contribution to the so a community and the way what we found that is just to use UDAT, UDAT literature, mm -hmm. where we have created a community thanks to in the, or in the content field synergy, where we have the metadata, particularly for, for B2 share, but also the metadata that we are included from open events. So we go at a DOI. Here's a little bit the 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 the, the workflow that we do. So we have participant bands submitting data to open events, we validate the quality is okay, the performance is okay, and so on and so forth. And then we have the way that those results are combined with the results of the community. And eventually, the, the once everything is approved, then participants can submit the data to UDAT. In UDAT, we have either data for uh, normal participants, or we can also have data for the whole challenge. So you say, well, at a given point in time, the version 7 of this uh, community is this where we have 20 participants, for instance. And then you can, of course, evolve over time and so on and so forth. So uh, we have the results here that contains individual data and, part and the, com the combination. And that is always linked to open events. So you can always go back there and say, OK, I would like to use the input data of that participant, for instance, to train my own, my own data. So, just to, to finalize, I will say that we are a, a community-driven and a community-open uh, platform. So for us, documentation is essential because we are talking with many different communities in life sciences. So life sciences is quite broad. So we have to spend a lot of time in our documentation trying to explain all the different components of open events. But still, we are more than happy to hear comments and feedback or take contributions by the community how to make the documentation better. We want to make the adoption curve as smooth as possible. And with that, I just want to to, hire, to thank you for listening to us and many people uh, in the past and, and current members. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salvador, uh, for a, a fascinating presentation. We do, in fact, have a, a question, which is more of a comment, but I think it hides a deep insight inside of it. He says, and, and Salvador, benchmarking is easing your life at BSC, isn't it? Uh, and I believe what he's saying is that benchmarking is probably a good idea in anybody's own work to, to help make it better. Uh, do, you, uh, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, so we do benchmarking every day while we are we're going to buy a mobile phone. The first thing that we do is just to compare things. So actually, uh, uh, benchmarking is present in everywhere. What we try to do here is uh, work at the elixir level because this is part of a systematic effort to annotate software, as we were saying, to containerize software and to, to make it sustainable. So we don't want to make this one shot and that's it. We want to make this periodic so the communities can always have a reference and say, oh, the software is performing this way or this another way. So it takes a lot of time. And just to, to say, uh, we're in a supercomputing center, but we use a lot of cloud services rather than HPC because that is community oriented. And many times the community say, no, no, we have our own software at house, at any home. So we are not going to move it somewhere else because it's quite complex. So we prefer to give you the results. The, we run, we agree in the inputs, we run the predictions, we give you the prediction and you make the evaluation. But we're not moving the software somewhere else. So it's, it's uh, using a lot of cloud resources. I'd like to close with one final question uh, that is relevant to uh, what is happening and what this webinar is all about. Uh, you made the decision to bring the, the, uh, the, the system, the, the, the Open eBench, into the uh, EOS marketplace. Uh, what brought you to that decision? And was it easy? Uh, did it go smoothly or was it a, a, a rough job? I think uh, it's important to recognize of, of the value of EOS and the EOS marketplace to be, to be transversal. 
there are other things to, to learn from, from other communities beyond life sciences. Elixir might be a good proxy for life sciences, but there are other communities beyond life sciences and beyond Elixir. So we thought the EOS marketplace might be a good place to be and then to be contacted and to contact others. Regarding the registration, the EOS marketplace for us was easy, but I have to confess because BSC was a road register. I heard from other colleagues that if you are not registered, that is going a little bit trickier or take much more time. In our case, it was kind of easy and relatively uh, fast. Thank you very much. Uh, so there has been also a very interesting discussion on Slido. Uh, 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 you're all welcome to uh, to read the discussion because we need to close now because very soon we are going to uh, start the next uh, uh, the next session, which will be at 12.15 with a session uh, uh, which is entitled Discovering Services for Open Science. So uh, with many thanks to my panelists, Salvador, who is uh, right in front of me, and, and also to Bjorn and Antonio, uh, once again, many thanks. And we'll see you soon in a few minutes for the next session. Goodbye, everybody. Hi, good morning again. And uh, welcome to this Pan-European Digital Assets Supporting Research Communities Benefits and Opportunities webinar. So I think uh, we can start. So my name is um, Paula Moura and I work uh, with the documentation services at University of Minho, Portugal, and we participate in Open Air Nexus project and also been working together with Open Air for more than 10 years in different projects and we also take part in EOSC Future project. So before we start some housekeeping rules, um, as you know, this session is being recorded and we'll make it available afterwards along with the presentations. We kindly ask you to have your microphone and cameras off during the presentations. And if you want to address any question, doubt or comment to the speakers, please drop a line in slido.com that our colleagues have been sharing the, the access in the chat. Um, and uh, I think uh, the speakers are, uh, all of them are here. So um, maybe I can move on forward. So um, this session has a generic approach dedicated to open air discovering services for researchers. Open Air's mission is to shift scholarly communication towards openness and transparency and facilitate innovative ways to communicate and monitor research. Uh, you can know more about open air in openair.eu. In this session, we intend to demonstrate how researchers can benefit from the services and discovery tools provided by and in collaboration with open air, starting with a few words from our service manager, Androniki Pavlidou, who will give us a brief overview of the discovering services, and after we continue with our invited speakers, Leonard Stoy, which will give us an insight into the range of possibilities that could be offered and prepared via a university alliance, Utopia, to better meet the needs of the researchers. Then we will follow with a presentation of Open Science Lens, a plugin designed to meet the needs of researchers when Googling for publications, software, or other research products. Here, Georgios Papanikos um, will walk us uh, through this presentation and demonstration of the advantages of its use and its potential, giving a new visibility to the open air research graph. We close the session with Cassandra Goldan Prague, a researcher who will guide us through her process of organizing her research results, highlighting the potential of using persistent identifiers such as ORCID ID or DOI and the multiple integrations that will facilitate our work from updating the curricula or, rep or for reporting uh, purposes, making use of Open Air Discovery Service Explore. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a 10 minutes for Q&A. Here, uh, we will use Slido tool where, where you can address your questions and comments. And uh, just a reminder that each speaker has uh, 10 minutes to present. Without further ado, I'll give you the floor to Androniki Pavlidou. Uh, we'll only have five minutes to present as service manager of Open Air. Thank you, Androniki, and the floor. Hi. So I hope you can see my screen. 
And actually, I hope I can switch uh, my screen because I cannot see it. Yes, you have to switch. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Now it should be fine, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be very, very brief. So welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. So I'm going to talk to you about the open air services uh, that cover the research life cycle. So we have here, we have a broad uh, range of the services that, as you can see here, we try to put them into a nice wheel. So when you have, for example, the Discover, you can go and check out which services can really satisfy your needs, help you out in your life, in your research life. So the services that you might already know, they are Zenodo, Scholar Explorer, the Open Air Research Graph, the Connect, and the Explore that you will have later uh, a very nice presentation about it. And then you might ask me, how does all this connect to each other? What do we have on open air? We have this workflow of information that passes from the researchers, from the minute you publish something, to the content providers, and then the info is the metadata information is collected from the research graph, and then that step by step is cleaned, is enriched, and then it reaches, for example, explore uh, for you. So you can very, very easily go there to explore and find out the information you're looking for. And now, if you ask me, okay, now how can I find all these services? How can I find information very easy for me to understand? You can visit the Open Air Services catalog, and then you will have all these filtering options. And you can, for example, I used Explore here. You can check the benefits of the service, the features of the service, legal and operational information, roadmap, uh, you know, something else you might need. Everything's there, use cases also. And last, if you want to, to you know, explore and have a look of more uh, services, because th that phase that you start is the discover will continue to the next one, of course, you can check out more of our services on the catalog again, and you can distinguish them very easily with the, the right image. So my invitation is come and discover all the services, discover more, give us feedback, feel free to judge us, and we are here to listen. So thank you very much, and thanks for inviting. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adorniki, <laughs> very quickly. So um, now I move the floor to Leonard. Um, Leonard Stoy, who is going to show how an alliance can facilitate fair and open research, um, the case of Utopia. Leonard is Open Science Project Leader at Freie Universität Brussels. I hope I pronounce it well and Secretary of the VUB Open Science Office. He coordinates the development of open science in Utopia Alliance, including the Utopia Open Research Portal. Thank you so much, Leonard, for accepting our invitation to be with us today, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paula. I suppose you can hear me, right? So I just assume that. Perfect. And I will, in parallel, set up the screens, of course. Um, and share it. Voila. And now you should be seeing uh, what I'm seeing. Yes. If I'm not wrong. Great. So yeah, I was kindly invited to um, to present indeed what we do uh, as an alliance of, of universities um, with uh, with the open air um, services for uh, discovery of, uh, of research outputs. Um, maybe I should briefly start with um, what our alliance is. It's um, Utopia is one of the 40, I think it's now 42 uh, European university alliances that are, have been funded um, for uh, several years um, by the European Commission in particular. Um, we have 10 members um, out of yeah, 10 different European countries and all of those I think uh, have a very different institutional profile so that's a, quite an interesting challenge actually for what, what's the, what, what was just mentioned about like generic services for a quite a heterogeneous uh, community so we collaborate around, across uh, research education but also some innovation activities and try to yeah, foster exchange uh, and collaboration among our researchers um, academics uh, and students. Um, we have also quite a, let's say, a, a sizable uh, number of, of students, uh, including uh, yeah, undergrad and master uh, students, but also, um, of course, a lot of academic staff. So we see 23,000 uh, academic staff, lots of research group, many different faculties that deal with different issues, 
different organizational cultures, of course, that come into play. Um, the libraries, of, of course, maybe I should mention in an open science um, themed uh, event too. So it is quite an interesting community to work with and to discover actually for ourselves what kind of services we can um, provide for them and for us as an alliance. So in terms of open science also very, very quickly, we do uh, mainly work across four uh, dimensions. And the first one is training and guidance. That is quite a prominent one because it's also relatively, um, let's say, um, low barrier to, to entry to start working on this. But then also we do want to work on a bit more alignment and harmonization of policies, um, developing some infrastructure, such as I'll be presenting today, and then also to keep coordinating and support this in the future. Uh, as with so many other things, this is funded by a couple of different projects. So it started with this Utopia 2050 project, which is in, was an Erasmus um, Plus call, so to, to the, the startup funding for these alliances, which didn't focus so much on open science uh, yet at that stage. In the Utopia train, which is the one you see on the top, that is really um, a Horizon 2020 project where open science had a dedicated work package where most of this work is also taking place um, that I'm presenting today. And then we have some others, for example, the, the Utopia CIF project is a, is a fellowship, a, an NSCA co-fund project. So we also want to, um, of course, facilitate the mobility of researchers, which is quite interesting then to, uh, as one of the use cases actually for the, for the discovery tool. And the Utopia More is just a follow-up project. So I'm just uh, showing them here now to uh, give the full picture of what we're doing as an alliance. If you're interested in the broader uh, landscape of things that we do in terms of open science, I've put a few things here on the slides. Um, we put most, or most if not all, um, resources, um, documents, guidance documents uh, on our Zignodo community. Um, plus also you have quite a lot of webinars and different topics that are uh, available via, via YouTube. So if you're interested in using them or reusing them, adapting them, you're most welcome to do so um, from, yeah, from, from our work. With the specifics of today, uh, we have one specific objective in one of the projects, which is that we uh, want to do, uh, want to develop yeah, a, a research portal for the research outputs of our uh, universities with um, the yeah, the second, uh, let's say, second level objectives that we want to have uh, the different the variety of research and research outputs of our researchers more visible. We want to make that uh, more easily findable um, through our own, let's say, uh, portals as well, for internal and as well, as well as external audiences. So internal could be researchers who want to collaborate, external could be anyone who looks for an expert, for example, at one of our universities. And that is then, there is another objective that is linked to that is actually that we of course want to make our outputs fair uh, and findable, um, for example, through repositories. And we also want to comply of course with funding requirements, for example, on the accessibility of the metadata. And all of this uh, converges a little bit in the, in the activity that we've been doing with Open Air, which is we have established um, the Utopia Open Research Portal, which is, I will tell you a bit of what the technology behind this uh, on the next slide, but it's our single entry now into all the developed different outputs that uh, are available, which is supplied by an open air uh, connect gateway. So An Antoniki just showed one of these showed one of these uh, flowcharts how it more or less works. This is what we uh, established as a collection of the the outputs of our uh, individual research uh, um, uh, universities of the repositories mainly. And as of now, we have some 680,000 actually uh, records in there. I didn't update the slides, but apparently we got a, got a few more in the last uh, harvesting round, including uh, some 440,000 or probably more now uh, that are available in open access. This is a relatively new tool as well. We've just launched this uh, at the end of October this year during International Open Access Week. So we are still really in the process of developing also the different uses that we uh, want to support with, uh, with this tool. You can see already it's quite an interesting overview what the kind of features that are offered by, by the open air service actually are. So we can search for the, the open access status there. You can search for the year, you can search for different document types. You see we have quite a lot of different ones there, including articles, book chapters, lots of theses are actually also harvested, which is also quite interesting. Um, fields of science, this is, I think, a, a test thing that's also interesting for, of course, when you search for different outputs, um, that's... Um, I think well, it's a better version by Open Air, which is very, uh, very nice to uh, to be able to see this develop. And also, for example, by Funder, and we get a nice overview as well over the outputs. And this is just uh, some of the features that help you searching for uh, relevant outputs uh, through this gateway. 
how it works. Um, just showing here on the right, this is almost what was just shown before. So our Utopia repositories, they are mostly already harvested by, by open air and feeding into this research graph, which has made us the, the decision easier to actually decide to use the open air service. Plus open air also collects the author affiliations and kind of uh, matches them with the institutions that, that we, uh, of course, the, the institutional identities that we gave to um, the open air colleagues. So this is all collected by open air and then prepared through this uh, community gateway so that only the outputs that are actually affiliated with our institutions are shown through this uh, Utopia Open Research Portal. So it's a very nice um, feature for us because we have the benefits for this that we see that um, we are using an ex existing service. So there's a little, little bit less maintenance needed than if we would have to develop something like this by ourselves, if we had to hard code it uh, some, somewhere, it would be, uh, of course, a bit different type of uh, sustainability questions for us. And the availability of this via open air, because we, of course, expect that this will be offered uh, in the future as well to, to these communities. We hope that we can develop some additional services on this, maybe via the APIs that are offered by open air, which could be interesting, but we're, this is really exploratory. Plus, it allows us also to have an integrated search for the Zenodo community and different projects as well which is quite a nice feature to, to have to see what the different projects that we are running actually produce in terms of output. So this is a bit of the technical side. And I just want to um, show a little bit of the different use cases that we have explored. So for example, we have researchers that are mobile across the 10 institutions because we offer the fellowships to go to another institution. So how do you find researchers across the 10 universities? Of course, you can also look at the websites and Google it, but you can also, for example, try to see uh, through this portal now and see uh, specifically on your research topic if you will find recent re research activities, publications that have been coming out of one of the members. And then you can approach, for example, the, the, the researchers uh, if they would be willing to host you as a, as a postdoctoral researchers, um, for instance. I think this is, this is one use case of the current version, at least. A similar thing, for example, if you want to be, if you're working as a journalist and you want to uh, do this, perhaps you could also use the, the portal and then you will see how much actually we are active uh, on specific SDGs or fields of science to identify experts on different topics from one of the members. Finally, this is a little bit uh, more of an internal task is that the, you told, that, the mon that the open air services also allow us to monitor actually across our 10 universities, what is happening in terms of op open science outputs, but also just in terms of research outputs in general. So for example, we can get a good overview over the number of publications, the data, the research data that has been produced, uh, software outputs over time and how this develops, how it complies with funder mandates, or also how we are active in for certain SDG areas or, or fields of science might be interesting to identify further um, collaboration opportunities that should be maybe supported institutionally. So this is also a nice uh, tool to, to monitor what is ongoing. And this is something that we're exploring with, with open air as well. This is actually my last slide. So I hope uh, roughly in the 10 minutes, what do we do uh, next? As I said, it's a very uh, young output so far, a young result that we still want to work on. So we have some repositories still to add or to, to make compliant with the open air graph which is also an incentive of this collaboration. So it's also uh, internally some incentives to get our repositories up to, up to date and the newest uh, compliance criteria to make the metadata available, et cetera. We want to clean up our affiliation record as well because it will help um, to, uh, you know, to de deduplicate the number of different spellings of our own institutions is always an issue, which we want to yeah, do in the coming months a little bit more strongly. We also want to look at, uh, that's for the monitoring at the open air monitoring services because they're directly linked to, to this community. So it's very easy to establish now a service uh, based on the gateway that we have already uh, established. And then features that would maybe look more into the website integration, which is then something for our community that they can directly from the Utopia website um, send a search request and then maybe see the results on the Utopia uh, on this portal page, but at least it's on our website. So these are things that we would like to do. Um, plus maybe other services. Uh, this is also a nice added um, benefit maybe for the future, how this can maybe link up with other EOSC services as an alliance that might be interesting if we want to go use certain services uh, in the future in, a, in like in a collaborative way. 
that's a certainly a good start to to build on. Plus, as I mentioned, yeah, the the, the API is a, is a nice tool that I would be interested maybe in seeing how we can use this to visualize our collaborations. Maybe send a few uh, like small teams that can try to uh, can try to build something nice out of that, or or so that would be really interesting. And this is really it for me. I hope I'm on time here. If you want to go to the website, please uh, please check it out. Uh, please get in touch. Um, we we'll love to also hear other uh, suggestions and ideas what you can make with this because it's definitely a, it's, a, it's a journey, of course. So this is always very interesting to hear other feedback and comments and ideas what to what to use with these or how to use these tools. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonard. Um, I just copy past the question that Hans uh, put it in the chat to Slido, but uh, I think we will have some time to to answer that at the end. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your um, so clear presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have uh, Georgios Papanikos presenting Open Science Lens. Uh, Georgios is Chief of Technology Offices, Office uh, of Site uh, and Project Manager of Open Science Lens. So thank you so much, Georgios, and um, the floor the floor is yours. Okay, so hope you can uh, see me, uh, hear me, and see my screen too. Uh, okay. So if all that all those works, I can start uh, uh, by uh, saying hello also on my behalf. Uh, uh, my name is Yoros Papanikos, and um, I thank you uh, for your participation in this session on Open Science Lens too. Uh, I am the CTO at SITE, and for many years now we have been active advocates of open science, and throughout our involvement uh, and participation in several research projects, we had the opportunity to work with other researchers coming from a wide spectrum of domains and disciplines, uh, having day-to-day -day friction in their information discovery process. And this has led us to try and answer practical problems that we all face uh, during our information exploration journey, uh, utilizing proven, uh, proven and authoritative sources. Uh, so first, let's see what we mean by discovery and access process. Uh, what are the questions we are answering while trying to locate and access information? Starting off, we need to define what characterizes the resources we're looking for. So what sets them apart? Part of that answer, uh, part of the answer to that question will drive also the answer to the second question, which is given the characteristics of what we're looking for, which is the best place to look for them? Uh, some dedicated repository or perhaps a general search engine uh, might do the work better. And after getting an initial list of possible answers to our search, what kind of descriptive information do we have available? Uh, is what we get enough to understand, uh, uh, to understand that what we found looks interesting for a second, more in-depth look? And of course, uh, the, since we know that the information out there is pretty wide and not always trustworthy, uh, how can we be sure that we can rely on the information that we find? Uh, so after all is said and done, uh, then moving past uh, the descriptive information, the metadata of what we've discovered, how we can get access to the actual content, the data, the documents, the software, and so on. So we will see how through Open Science Lens, uh, we can be assisted in locating and exploring information relevant to open science while navigating the web uh, by bringing the open air research graph, the knowledge base behind Open Air Explorer in our browser closer to the researcher. So uh, taking a closer look into that process, um, uh, uh, firstly, uh, we need to define what it is that uh, we may be looking for. Uh, it could be any kind of resource, such as a publication, a data set, some software, a project, any other kind of uh, research product. Uh, depending on what I'm looking uh, for, but also on the domain in which this information belongs, I may use different filters to, look, to locate what I need, uh, terms that I may find in the subject of the item, the author, if I know them, uh, something that relates to the methodology that I expect to have been used to produce a research outcome, the publisher of the article and data, and so on. My filters now may be very specific or pretty wide. Uh, so in which data sorts can I apply them to get the results that I would need? Uh, the best case scenario uh, would take me to a complete, structured, organized, up-to-date repository with the reference, disambiguated, cleaned up information, and already this sounds a lot, uh, and it may not, uh, often not be available. Uh, so I may also need to look at public search engines. 
So starting my search, I get a list of possible matches, but the information I find is often just a subset of what is available or what I need. And is usually mirroring the view, knowledge, and domain interest of the specific site or publisher and the resources available to them to author and enrich that content. Uh, so it is only to be expected that it will not be possible to have a full author catalog, the information of all the supporting projects, the funding streams, and much more uh, of the possible metadata replicated everywhere for me to access. Uh, so still what I, uh, what I usually reach this way is only a descriptive information of what I'm looking for, metadata on the item. Uh, and at the best case, uh, also some persistent identifier that I may be able to reference while trying to find the repository that holds the actual resources, uh, the actual resource, and uh, through which I can get access to the full content. So at this point, uh, we put Open Science uh, and the tools built uh, to support it uh, in view. And um, what we what would be great is if we had access to all the supportive information, aggregated, curated, and served where and when we needed it. And this is what Open Science Lens does for us, uh, and of course backed by the Open Air Research Graph, allowing us to carry the Open Air knowledge base with us regardless of the search engine or repository that we use. And now before we see how we can use it, first a quick glance on how we can get it. Uh, the easiest way is to add it to your browser as an extension. It is available on Google Chrome and Microsoft Edge at this point, and it will soon be available also for more browsers. You just need to visit your browser store, uh, if it is uh, the Chrome Web Store or the Microsoft Edge add-ons, and search for uh, Open Science Lens, and just click on the Add to My Browser button. Um, it has already uh, started drawing the attentions of researchers around the globe, the globe and uh, primarily in the two sides of the Atlantic this far. Uh, so once we get it, what can we do with it? Uh, see, uh, let's see a first uh, a few use cases for it. And... Um, uh, first is the author disambiguation uh, use case. Uh, there may be multiple researchers with the same name and simple name and simple name listing next to a, a publication is often not enough. Uh, persistent identifiers for the authors such as work IDs are often not available in the initial listings. Uh, but uh, if while browsing, we actually come across a publication that Open Science Lens is able to locate within Open Air Research Graph, uh, we will be able to get a qualified reference to the specific author. So this uh, can prove very useful uh, in a number of occasions uh, and helps actually build also trust uh, in the content that, uh, that we're browsing, especially knowing uh, uh, the field of researchers whose work matches uh, our, uh, our interest. Another use case uh, is uh, um, uh, that of uh, finding out related work. Um, so you can expand pretty much your search indirectly and uh, not by extending the initial filters, but through linked and relevant findings to what you've already located. Given an initial publication that we, uh, that we find, uh, we can also see if available related publications or even related data sets. Uh, so those linked items are again directly uh, referenceable so we can click and access them from the extension information panel directly without uh, doing a new search. Uh, another use case now equally important to the main article, it would be the citations and link data that uh, we can also find uh, and navigate through uh, directly from the item that we have initially uh, located. So without leaving the initial publication landing page for any link data or citation that is listed, we can directly get descriptive information on them. And this in turn can be used both to better understand the context of the item that we located, as well as to identify items that may be of further interest to us. So we can use this information to build a better understanding on the context of what we're seeing and not depend just on the, on the title. Uh, next, uh, locating information that seems interesting is only, of course, the first part of the journey. Uh, usually the work starts right after that, uh, getting the content and actually uh, diving in. So this is often not as straightforward as it initially seems, especially after you have already reached a listing describing what you're looking for. Uh, and there are many known tools and sites, I expect most have used some of them, uh, out there that uh, would allow us, given a DOI, to retrieve the relevant content. Um, Open Science Lens allows us to do it directly from where we are without needing to look anywhere else. Uh, so all the repositories through which the content is available is directly listed along with indicators on whether it is served as open access or not. So we can uh, directly navigate to the open access version and get uh, what we're looking for. 
Now, uh, what we have been seeing this far is primarily relying on DOIs on the items being directly available on the web pages we're browsing. And this is making use of a very convenient handle, uh, but terms and context-based retrieval may also be very useful uh, because DOIs are not always available. Uh, but this uh, would be uh, this would need us uh, to move past the Open Science Lens browser extension and into the realm of Open Science Lens Enhancer, which is a content provider-based uh, uh, solution uh, that allow researchers reaching the site of the content provider to offer all this functionality that we see as a site-embedded feature without the researcher needing to actually download and use anything in their own browser. Uh, so this would allow uh, a much richer experience to the visitor of the site, which would be us. Uh, so I think that uh, with this, we can uh, try to wrap up a little bit what we said. Um, we can distinguish three main benefits we can directly gain from the usage of Open Science Lens in the discovery and access process. Uh, firstly, uh, it assists the deep exploration process to locate research artifacts. It enhances repository item listing, breaking silos imposed by domain perception, technical limitations and uh, available resources of its uh, uh, publisher. It utilizes the open air research graph to present an aggregated, cleaned up, linked view of the open science artifacts. And um, this is what Open Science Lens is all about. It's about having enriched information readily available during the discovery process. By enhancing the information we locate, by increasing the trust of our findings, simplified access to the content, and utilizing con continuously enriched and expanding knowledge base, knowledge base which is the open air research graph. So uh, in, uh, in brief, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank you um, from uh, your attention. Uh, this is it from us, and I will be very happy to answer any questions in the Q&A timeframe. Thank you so much, Georgios. <laughs> it was very nice to, to see the, the potential of this tool. And now can the graph, the research graph from open air um, um, can be used uh, in the, when developing these kind of services. Thank you so much. You. Um, and now, um, the last but not the least, um, and to finalize, I invite Cassandra Goldvan Prag from University of Oxford, a researcher contributing to open science infrastructure at the Wellcome Center for I Integrative Neuroimaging. Uh, with her presentation, uh, evidencing uh, your varied contributions using ORCID ID and DOIs via open air. Uh, thank you, Cassandra, and the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I can't see the other screen, so I can assume that you can see it, maybe. Yes, it's all good. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, thank you. Thank you for this um, invitation to contribute to this discussion. It's It's really inspiring to see the amount of work that's going on behind the scenes um, to improve the experiences of researchers um, in terms of how they um, function in this space of open science and the changes to academia. So my role at the Wellcome Center for Integrative Neuroimaging, we're a brain, brain imaging center, is my role is to help other researchers do open science. So we're developing infrastructure, but also uh, deliver a fair amount of training on things like Git and version control. And um, a lot of the processes that I share with researchers are things I've developed myself as a researcher before I stepped into this um, community manager role. So the, the workflow I'm going to show you today is a bit of a step back from the kind of um, level of complexity that we've seen in the earlier presentations. And it's more of a kind of a researcher perspective on how to actually implement these things in the standard researcher workflow. So um, the the I'm going to illustrate the process with a, a cartoon, so really simplistic. So first, we as researchers, um, we know that our outputs are tracked and indexed for things like assessment when we're going for promotions or, or new jobs. Now, for a long time, that assessment was based primarily on journal outputs and associated metrics. But now, um, fantastically, we're now also being assessed on contributions like code, data and other things like um, mentoring or, or other opportunities that we contribute to research culture. Now, when we were assessed based on just on journal metrics, uh, there was a whole infrastructure behind the scenes where the indexing and tracking of those outputs, our journal outputs, was all handled for us. Researchers didn't really have to do much at all. 
But now with these other outputs, the researcher has to have um, a small role in making sure that these outputs are gathered and represent our work um, in a holistic way. So the um, open air services and practices have made it possible for, for me and the researchers that I uh, train and facilitate, we can gather all of these outputs very efficiently and very effectively and prepare ourselves to be assessed as a holistic researcher. And this, uh, the, the workflow I'm gonna share touches on these, all these different corners of, of open air. And the, the main um, important parts for me are that all of these services are integrated and linked in a way that means I as a researcher don't have to worry too much about what's going on in the background. I just have to follow a few simple rules and then everything is all magically appears for me, which is fantastic. Um, so first up, I'm gonna show you this, this may seem really simplistic if you're um, working at the level of developing all this infrastructure, but I wanted to be very specific with you all here. So when I use Zenodo, I make sure that I always log in with my ORCID ID. Um, so this means that any entries that I add on to Zenodo will automatically be associated with me, and that becomes um, important later on. And this is what I tell our researchers to always um, log in with your ORCID ID. And then here you have uh, all of my Zenodo entries. I use other tools to create DOIs as well, but Zenodo is a good one for me. Now, after you've logged into Zenodo, the next important step is to make sure that you add your ORCID ID when you're creating your research object or um, issuing a DOI for your research object. So this is me just filling in um, the information to create a DOI. And as, as important as it is for me to add my ORCID ID, whenever I'm uh, sharing outputs that I've created up with other people, I always make sure that their ORCID is also entered in the um, Snodo entry. And then, of course, because we're good open scientists, it's going to have a license and a CC BY4 is my, my preferred license. Next on to the ORCID and, and open air explore side of things. So ORCID, as um, I'm sure you, you're mostly aware, is a, um, an online space where you can collect all of your outputs. And for me, I think of this as it's basically my CV. So it's, it has a biography, you can have my places of work and there's different sources of evidence. So my place of work is verified by my institution where other places of work can be verified just by yourself. And then here at the bottom, here are my research outputs or my works. And if I want to add a new work that isn't already, doesn't magically appear um, from a journal, for example, I use Open Air Explore to find those outputs because I know that they are um, mostly issued by Zenodo, which is um, indexed by Open Air. So as you can see, I've got two outputs there. One that it, I had the option to delete that record from ORCID, which means it was already in ORCID. And then this one wasn't in ORCID. So I have just clicked a simple button and Open Air will make it appear in my ORCID ID, um, in my ORCID record a little bit later on. Very, very straightforward. And another useful tool for me in Open Air Explore is the name disambiguation. So my name um, often gets sort of chunked up in different ways by perhaps um, collaborators who don't know me too well, or sometimes the journals or other outputs will decide which part of my name is the surname and which is like some other part. So um, I use Open, uh, Open Air Explore to find other outputs that um, I know are mine, I recognize them as being mine, but haven't already appeared because the name's been spelled wrong, for example. So here is a data set that a researcher um, that I contributed to. And again, it's as simple as add a button, uh, press the button to add it to your ORCID profile. And then the other side of ORCID is, uh, or the other path of connection on this program, on this um, diagram here is how from my ORCID, I can go straight to the research um, output itself. So all of these things are linked with DOIs, which means from ORCID, I can go straight to the research output. And if I was, for example, sending my CV to a um, for an assessment, I know that if I add the DOI or my ORCID, then I can very straightforwardly evidence the work that I have said that I talked about. So here, just some different types of, of um, outputs that I've been uh, collated under my ORCID. And then the final connection in this diagram is um, how this is all made possible by Zenodo being my preferred DOI issuer and Zenodo being indexed in open air, which means that I can be confident that anything that I put on Zenodo has been um, carefully 
uh, collated and I know that I can find it again with other tools and those tools all being linked together makes the process really simple and straightforward for me. So really the key here uh, uh, for me as a researcher is one that I have to use these tools consistently. Um, so I, I think it for the researchers that I support, they um, initially struggle to make things like the step change from issuing a DOI for a piece of work. Um, often they spend many months of um, reviewing revisions internally before they'll put anything out externally. And we're trying to help nudge them to um, release those things with a DOI perhaps a little bit earlier, because the sooner it's the, the earlier it's out there, then the earlier other people can contribute to it and build on it. And um, we have to sort of help educate them about things like uh, scooping not being such a problem, because once something is, is out early, you can um, use the other people can use the DOI and you can use the DOI to evidence your, your claim to that work. So consistency and a bit of a behavior change in how people want to release um, their outputs and the interoperability behind all of these things and these persistent identifiers is really key. So it makes the process really simple for us, which um, makes it easier to make the more sort of cognitive behavioral change work uh, required. So that was a, a, a really quick tour for you, but to, to, to sum up the position of researchers and the people that I work with in our brain imaging center and beyond, the surprise for those folks is that um, code, data, educational materials, policy documents, project management, any kind of output and any work that you do can and should be considered as an important research output, um, which you uh, I, I, is valuable for you to be able to evidence when you're being assessed as a researcher for uh, career progression or for, for new jobs, for example. And the open air services enable a really efficient and effective tracking and indexing of, of all of these outputs. It's wonderful not to have to worry about any of the complexity in the uh, backstage and just know it's going to work. And um, I think it's really important that as we're requiring such a step change of our researchers that we make things as easy and simple for them as possible. So the consistency, the interoperability, and also the um, the confidence that we can have in services that are delivered by these, these big um, European um, consortiums and these, these big European projects is, is a really strong motivator for our researchers to get involved. Uh, so I hope that was uh, valuable for people. I'm, I've realised that I've been a little bit quick on that, but I think that's fine. So hopefully we'll have a bit more time for discussion. So I'll close there. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Cassandra, for your explanation and showing us um, how open air services are uh, helping researchers to to perform their tasks um, much much quicker than, and easier in an easier way. So it facilitates their their their, their jobs. So um, we have some questions um, here. Um, a uh, first one, I, I think both of them are for Leonard. Uh, one of them, uh, do you know how many researchers actually care about finding resources from these partner institutions, researchers? The question was much longer, but here on Slido, uh, it has some limited words, but uh, the question, I don't think you have the chance to see it, Leonard, or yes? Yeah, I see something in the chat, so I think that's, that's the same. <laughs> um yeah i think that this is this is the the good point about what is the use of let's say the, the search portal for the alliance overall that yeah i doubt that a researcher that is looking for articles on uh, protein structures or something will go firsthand to our own utopia portal i think this is not uh, certainly not the use case so i, I think and I would admit that the, probably there the number is, is very low is like the first instance that you go to if you generally generally look for outputs. But yeah, in the end, we want to um, show the use cases, for example, yeah, if you need a researcher from our institutions, then you don't need to um, go somewhere else and type the names of 10 different institutions in the search bar or like the end and the if functions in a search field, you can simply go to the Utopia portal and find these outputs there. So this is one of the things that yeah it's specifically when you look for something for our in, you know, institutions this is an easy uh, way to to access most of the information um that provided that it's harvested by open air but i think there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of uh, good coverage of outputs that are sort of in the in the research graph um i, I hope i answered this i think yeah i would admit that it's 
Mm -hmm. We need to define the use cases, certainly for a community that is so diverse for our own researchers. This is why I tried to, to stress this in the beginning as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we, we have another one here on Slido. How do you envision the added value uh, that EOS can give for Utopia? Yeah, this is similarly um, an important question to, to figure out for ourselves. Um, what EOSC provides in terms of services. Um, if you count open air now already as an EOSC service, this is very nice as a start. I'm sure there are more, um, let's say there are more tricky discussions when we come about all the whatever interoperability of, of research data storage services or something. This is something that's very difficult to indeed, um, let's say, discuss with 10 very different universities and 10 different IT departments and 10 different uh, policies and data, uh, let's say, sensitivity policies. So this is a little bit a challenge indeed for, I would say, a, a very generic alliance such as ours. Yes. But we will certainly be looking at services by like open air, as I mentioned, uh, the monitor service, maybe um, these are interesting things that are useful for alliances, I, I suppose. Um, but when it comes to really very specific um, EOSC services in general, there may be some of those will be more useful for a specific research community rather than for an alliance than that is very broad and that is only, let's say, can do so much as a as an alliance and needs to leave some of activities to uh, to a specific community in a certain field. Um, and I hope that gave an idea what, what how we think at least about EOSC services. Yes. I don't know if the other speakers want to say or add something about because I think this question is um, why they could be. Oh, there's another one for Cassandra. Do you think uh, do you think that uh, your use case can help early career researchers to have an open scientist CV? Absolutely. Um, so you know if we think. What, what do we mean by an open scientist CV? We mean a CV which has evidence of you doing open science. And if that is sharing data or code, then this is one way to uh, to build that CV. So I know some folks do um, have developed tools where you can automatically populate a, a paper or PDF CV with your ORCID profile. Um, that's not what I do, but it's the, it, it is the place where you can have that continuous update of your CV. And um, I think another really valuable part of that continuous update is that it's ready now. You know, you don't have to wait for um, your journal publication to come out. And, you know, that that's the work that you were doing maybe two, three years ago is now being published in a journal. If you publish your separate outputs um, earlier or in, in different places, then you've got more regular updates on your CV, which is really strong evidence that you're participating in open science and you're promoting it as a culture. So yeah, definitely a good tool for this. Okay, so I don't think we have more questions and we are um, a little bit late Then we need to close the session. So a big thank you. Um, to the speakers and to all the participants for being here with us today. And we hope to have contributed a bit more uh, to the clarification of what EOSC represents, its potentialities for research community in supporting data intensive research, data discovery, among other functionalities in order to become an added value for researchers and then users. Don't forget tomorrow we have the second day of this session starting at uh, nine central European time. Uh, and please have a look at the program. Uh, I think I can share it here, the link with you. And uh, um, I will leave the session open for you for just a few minutes if you want to copy some of the links and information shared in the chat, uh, if it is of your interest. So the program is here. So thank you so much again uh, to all the speakers for being here and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a nice afternoon. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>